that's it. And without further, further ado, I will uh, pass it to Abdurrahman to give us uh, his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Agro. My screen now. So can we all see my slides fine? Yes. Okay, so um, today I'll be talking about how cities can be empowered to do better uh, data collection and planning uh, through skilled people and technology, which is also, uh, I'll be telling this through our story at Transport Work Island. Now, TFC was founded in 2016 by people from different backgrounds for, from urban informatics and tech backgrounds. They were looking into how they can combine their knowledge to solve mobility uh, problems in Cairo. Now, today, TFC is a mobility consultant that is uh, supported, empowered by uh, uh, the tech arm. So sometimes it can be viewed as a tech startup or a mature consulting firm. And it seems sometimes that we're suffering an identity crisis, but that's not the case. So what's new about this model, uh, the TFC model? Why were we founded? Uh, wasn't there someone already doing this? Uh, what's new is that we saw the first step to solve this mobility issue in Cairo is to create a comprehensive transport information system. Um, by comprehensive, we mean that it has to be complete. It has to take, for example, paratransit into account. More than 50% of the passenger uh, daily passenger trips are taken by paratransit in Cairo, and they were never uh, taken into consideration properly uh, in previous studies. So this, uh, what we see now, this chart is the traditional composition of an information system from a technical perspective. We can see that it's composed of data, it's composed of hardware, the hardware that you're collecting and storing the data in, it's comp composed of software, the processes, the set of processes that you've built to reach, uh, to create and uh, maintain your data, the people that work with the data, that create the data, but also who consume the data and uh, the data itself. Uh, today, we'll touch on the data and the uh, process, but we'll be focusing on the people and the software components. Now, uh, we'll go back to our first project at TFC, our first mapping project. We got a small fund to map our new urban communities. Uh, these are new cities that are surrounding Cairo and Giza from the east and the west. And they are planned in a relatively more organized way than the rest of Cairo. So they're new. Um, the residential areas are well known, the commercial areas are well known. Um, so mapping them was, even mapping the paratransit in them was relatively uh, an easy job, even with the obstacles that we faced because it was our first mapping project. So this was a success. Uh, the initial data set was used in trip planning and analysis. Uh, it was the first time you can see a microbus, which is the Matatu or the share taxi in other countries. Uh, it's the first time you can see it on uh, applications like uh, Google Maps, for example, for trip planning. Uh, it's the first time you can include it quantitatively in analysis. And we were commissioned to expand this work uh, to the whole greater Cairo region to conduct an, a job accessibility analysis. So we thought, yeah, great. Uh, we were excited. Uh, we had a big team. Uh, so we uh, looked at making it even bigger, big research team. And we thought, yeah, this is very, you know, wonderful. But then it wasn't uh, so wonderful when we went into the street and actually started doing the work. Uh, we are dealing with a city of 20 million people. We thought, yes, it's going to be a little bit uh, harder. We are public transport users ourselves. But uh, uh, making reality, like modeling reality into a neat, organized information system is a very hard uh, challenge. So. For example, we started ask, asking ourselves uh, questions that we thought at the beginning were givens. So what is a route? Um, uh, is this a route? Is this another route? Or is this the same route, but with a different naming? Um, the driver chooses to take a completely different itinerary based on the passengers that are riding with them and where they want to drop off. 
uh, what is the terminal and where exactly this terminal is located. It's divided into six uh, clusters across a whole neighborhood, for example, and they are used interchangeably. So all the different challenges that you can uh, think of. And um, also the passenger information system was very poor. This is a photo from a terminal in Cairo where you can see the bus lines are written uh, like a graffiti statically on the wall. And of course, those are not updated up to date and they are not um, uh, aligned with the very dynamic nature of the network. So the task was very stressful, to be honest. The team uh, worked overtime for weeks, uh, creating assignments for the field researcher in the field for the next days, but also getting feedback from them, trying to make sense of all of it uh, to build this comprehensive information system that we want to build. But out of this painful process, we learned a lot. We, uh, we started structuring our thoughts. We started structuring our data, our processes, how uh, to capture data better, how to store it, and so on. So the processes were already uh, being built. The pipeline was being built. But also this feedback from the field and this efficient process, we wanted a framework to uh, store it in, you know, we needed a core for our different parameters of the transport information system. Uh, we needed a core for that. We wanted a component that we can make this whole process reproducible to make things easier for the people in the future um, and so on, and make sure we collect accurate data. So from there uh, came Route Lab. And Route Lab is basically a software suite that we decided to build. Uh, to be tailored specifically for this kind of uh, task and for the storage of paratransit uh, uh, data data entities. So it's basically a software suite. It has its own mobile app, which we call Observer. And this mobile app is dedicated for the field researchers. They can see the assignments in the given uh, time interval, in the given uh, location based on your sample distribution. It uh, also has its backend components, which is the root lab dashboard. It's a monitoring and control dashboard. It's a content management system also for your transport network components. So you can catalog the routes, the terminals, the bus stops, and so on and so forth. But you can also monitor uh, your field research KPIs. You want to see how many person days, how many days have been spent uh, here. Uh, how long do we have to spend until we reach our sample size um, today compared to yesterday, how our progress is and so on and so forth. This is one example of the usage of Observer where the field researcher in the field is actually uh, seeing the zones that they need to go to to conduct an origin destination survey with the passengers. They can see the zones where they are, how far do they have to walk to it, and the time interval is the uh, decided upon, for example, we wanted this captured during the morning peak or the evening peak and how many surveys are left, uh, are left and so on. So you can see how the components are connected to each other. Also, we are getting feedback from the field researcher, for example, this uh, in Accra, Ghana. Uh, you can see the blue pin is where the field researcher is saying the terminal is located at but the blue box is where we had previously digitized our terminal. So this will uh, instantly throw the question, have we identified the location of the terminal wrong? Is the terminal split into multiple parts? Uh, or is, is this particular route that the field researcher is talking about is, is parked uh, outside of the terminal? So all these questions. We've reused this tool again in Kampala in Uganda. and. Um, We've, we've seen how the process became much smoother, how we can build capacity for the local team there. We were working with Map Uganda, which are uh, a subset from Open Street Map Uganda. And we saw how they can easily learn the tool, how, they, how we can uh, fit it in a different context other than, uh, than Cairo. So capacity building became an integral part of our whole solution. And this image is from an open street map workshop with the students in Makareri University, uh, which was designed to build their capacity on using open street map data and uh, becoming contributors eventually to open street map. Another uh, component of uh, Root Lab 
the software suite is Lens, and Lens was this, uh, designed to automate section counts uh, based on local, again, local context. So, for example, the Boda Bodas, the motorcycles in Kampala, um, there was uh, no real attempt to measure them quantitatively uh, before the study. Uh, we decided to use automated section counts to measure the Boda Boda flow and compare to the shared taxis, traffic flow in uh, locations, uh, which the traffic police in Kampala was generous enough to give us the video feeds from the cameras. But those could have been also videos that were filmed um, by our field researchers or else. So this tool, we are looking into using it in Cairo uh, at the moment to conduct a feasibility study on the ring road. Now, where does this lead us? Uh, and what is the mindset beh behind creating and using these tools? What is our vision for that? We, our vision for that is that the development priorities should be driven by African cities' uh, necessities. So we do not need to use fancy terms like machine learning and AI, even though we employ them, um, if they're not applicable in a specific context. We look at the uh, priorities. So from, at least from this portal's point of view, the large, most African cities remain unmapped uh, in terms at least of GTFS feeds, uh, updates are costly. Uh, there is sometimes a lack of institutional capacity or there is no political will because to, to, to do mapping because the benefits are not uh, visible right away. So we want to give this example where uh, of Accra, uh, Ghana, the Department of Transport, where we are currently doing a mapping project uh, to see where the government have actually skilled people who have conducted this work before and who uh, were able to uh, use our set of tools right away uh, to make the process more efficient. And thus, you have political will, at least from our point of view in this particular project in Accra, in the Department of Transport uh, to do mapping and they see the importance of that. So in the, in the case of Ghana, it's not like Cairo where we started from scratch. We are actually updating a data set that was already there. Uh, so with skilled people in positions of uh, you know, uh, decision-making, uh, we will see more political will to do the mapping and to maintain the data. So what's next for RootLab, the software itself? RootLab is currently evolving into a data management platform for the cities to maintain and manage their own data. So we're imagining this, there is a one-time data acquisition uh, process that happens uh, that leads into continuous data acquisition. Continuous data acquisition done by, at the terminals, for example, by dispatchers, by operators, by uh, regulators, by whoever is willing to continue on with this mapping exercise and updating this uh, data set. And this data would be consolidated in a visual dashboard where the public transport agency can validate and integrate uh, the data as we go. Uh, also, we're looking into integrating licensed databases and the camera monitoring onto the uh, dashboard to have everything in one place, basically, and um, connecting the dots. Um, in, the, in the near future, we're looking into maybe smarter way of operating uh, bus routes such as smart dispatch based on demand uh, basically what's going on organically in the street right now uh, in some cities uh, but with uh, the, 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 the you know regulation uh, aspect of it so eventually we're looking into transforming this black expensive box of expensive hardware and expensive software making it into an affordable reproducible framework uh, for mapping and uh, uh, managing your, uh, the transportation data. So that's it uh, for, for me. Uh, if you'd like to talk to our tech team, you can reach out to us at Tech at Transport for Cairo. We would love to hear you, any, any feedback you might have. Thank you for giving me the time. Thank you very much, Abdurrahman, for your wonderful presentation. and. Uh... I will, uh, we, we will have like, I can see that there are some questions, but we will have them during the discussion session. And uh, I'll pass it on to Enoch for his presentation. And Enoch, you have eight minutes uh, to present your uh, presentation. Thank you. 
Thank you, Agra. I'm happy to see a lot of people, familiar, new people, and it's been forever. So I uh, will be telling you quickly and uh, in a snappy manner about one word or one project we've had uh, in almost uh, every presentation or talk since yesterday. And uh, maybe after mine as well, which is uh, OpenStreetMap. We'll just tell you about uh, what uh, to who. My name is Enoch. And, uh, I'm one of the many OpenStreetMap contributors around uh, the world. And I'm from Ghana. Yeah, of course, I was in Ghana as well. So what, uh, what is OpenStreetMap? Um, some say OpenStreetMaps, OpenMapStreet and whatever, but uh, it's OpenStreetMap or you can say OSM for short. Uh, OpenStreetMap is global, collaborative and open, just special database, of course, and a community. So started uh, way back in 2004. Why was it started? Uh, because uh, of inaccessible and availability of uh, data from the UK, from a mapping agency where everybody wants data to do something interesting or something beautiful, but due to barriers uh, of uh, accessing this data, it was difficult. So yeah, enthusiasts and people wanting to maybe map their hiking trails or need just street network access data quickly could trace them, go out there, record them with a smartphone, GPS tracking device, and come back home and map it. So when you go to openstreetmap.org, you will see um, the image to the right, which is just uh, some uh, data rendered in OSM Kato. And the ambition is to map the world from scratch from 2004 is still the, the, the ambition. And so far, so good, it has been going good. Now, OpenStreetMap is an example of uh, what uh, we can call the community of practice. And uh, the community of practice is kind of an interesting and uh, a recursive loop that uh, spreads down to even the, the branches that are not yet developed. So everyone benefits from what uh, is happening in the community of practice where people share the same passion. I would say um, Digital Transport for Africa is also a community. Communities are the powerhouse of uh, a lot of projects and initiatives. If you have a project and you don't have um, the human force running behind it with the passion and the motivation, I don't think we can go far. So in OpenStreetMap, there are a lot of uh, small, small, small communities uh, which make up of this community of practice. Now we're talking about public transport mapping. Of course, there is a community in OpenStreetMap which is focusing on public transport, everyone and their interests. But in all, this community learn from each other and interact regularly by sharing knowledge, skill, and whatever tools are being used. And uh, this brings us now to how. How is uh, OpenStreetMap made? Or how can you also contribute or use OpenStreetMap data or be part of this community? Everybody can be part of this community. You don't need to pay any monthly dues. Um, that is the interesting thing about uh, communities of practice. And OpenStreetMap community uses free, libre, and open source software solely to create the data that is uh, accessible to everyone. Uh, like Mr. Sabra of Linus Sakra will say that free and open source software provide a global playing field for everyone. These tools are not uh, paid for, but it does not mean these tools cannot bring you uh, financial independence. So uh, open source software are key to the OpenStreetMap community. And no matter wherever you are, maybe you're in Ghana, France, or Austria or Germany, is the same OpenStreetMap database, a central database. So when someone maps, public transport in the US, the same way, the same methodology that is being used to map public transport into OSM in Accra is the same methodology that will be used to map everywhere, makes it one database for all of us. I put OSM to GTFS over here because we are talking on public transport. And uh, when public transport data is mapped into OpenStreetMap, then you need it in a GTFS format. This tool, which is also free and open source available on GitHub and GitLab can be used to produce data easily from OpenStreetMap, which is public transport related to GTFS, which we, we are talking about, you heard of uh, yesterday and to continue to hear about. And uh, for the upcoming slides, and so Christoph will talk about uh, GTFS, including uh, uh, Veteran as well. Now, the big question is uh, who is using OpenStreetMap? If everybody can contribute to OpenStreetMap, uh, I can just put something there, what is, uh, the, the guarantee, what is the quality assurance? A lot of us use OpenStreetMap. I use OpenStreetMap. If it were not to be good, we wouldn't be talking about OpenStreetMap in uh, uh, a couple of contexts already, a couple of presentations already. 
the multinationals humanitarian purpose for private and so on and so forth. There are many use cases of uh, open uh, street map. Uh, I was lucky to have involved, be involved in the uh, Accra Mobility Project, uh, Mobile 3, which made use of open street map. And um, that brings me to putting all together since we have just a uh, very little time. Um, open street map uh, and free and open source uh, software is just the tip of the iceberg to a lot of opportunities. Uh, you might have seen a lot of tools and other software or other stuff presented. And one thing you should understand is that uh, behind all of this, there is some kind of a free and open source software involved. And this gives us all a global playing field is the same drawing board. No matter where you are, you can still access these tools and use them for whatever. But in order to do this, we need to understand that is where capacity building comes in. Because if you don't understand the technical know, sometimes technical know how is not required, but is a prerequisite. It's very important to understand how this stuff works in order to reuse it. And uh, limited access to resources sometimes prevent us or prevent people. Not everyone has access to good internet uh, or the device to in order to make a map or reuse uh, the, the data. And we are talking about a sustainable um, partnership if you want to go beyond just uh, mapping. Sustainable partnership, just like maybe DT4 a program, several others in Accra, which uh, partnership with um, OSM Ghana and uh, AMA in 2017 to saw the first uh, mapping into OpenStreetMap, one of the early ones. And then the quality assurance, whenever we put data into OpenStreetMap, we collect data about transport, or whatever, we should be highly concerned about the quality of data. This is something that cannot be overruled. And last but not the least, uh, local knowledge. Local knowledge is really paramount. When we run a project, OpenStreetMap writes on local knowledge a lot. I remember from 2017, this screenshot here, when we finished uh, mapping in Accra, the one bus stop, even though there was field data collection, someone who was part of the project uh, was able to move this node from the other side of the road to the right location of the road. That tells you that with OpenStreetMap, the community or people are far uh, or a step ahead of uh, maybe the authorities in terms of when something changes or something goes wrong, it can be fixed very quickly. And um, to sum it all up, community, of course, we're talking about community here as well. And without community, there'll be no one here watching or following this uh, event as well, the same as OpenStreetMap. So annually, there is a state of the map uh, uh, conference uh, which showcases uh, a lot of activities and you might be seeing uh, familiar things you have seen for the past two days in some of this conference in a few days there will be state of the map global uh, that is uh, you can follow is free of charge and everybody can follow and understand what is happening in this community how you can be part of or you can reuse and of course um, africa regional conferences uh, in november but two years ago we had one in abidjan which was physical now that we can uh, connect physically is online uh, it was interesting that uh, yeah in 2019 there was a session on uh, public transport mapping and we're glad the AFD, which is one partner for DT4A, was also a, a partner, including the, the World Bank as well. Uh, I would like to stop here and pass on to the next uh, presenter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Enoch, and uh, I really appreciate your uh, precise presentation and uh, I can see that there are like lots of questions coming on the chat in the chat so I appreciate the panelists to go ahead and to give some answers like uh, otherwise we might not have uh, good, uh, enough time to discuss all this during the discussion session. So our next presenter is uh, Dr. Rafa and uh, I invite Rafael to present. Okay, good. Thank you, Agaral. Thank you, everyone, uh, for being here and watching this and following up the with the event. Uh, so today I'll be talking about uh, some of the a small part of the projects that, that I've been working on. And I really want to start discussing or just highlighting what are some of the greatest benefits and burdens of public transport systems. Um, and I, I guess we could all agree that there is a growing consensus that one of the most important benefits that we get out of public transport systems is access to opportunities. Uh, here we have a classic isochrone map of the city of Melbourne in the 1900s, showing how far you could travel within certain travel time budgets uh, just using the rail transport, uh, transport modes. 
And I think uh, more and more we have been seeing isochrone mapping and accessibility mapping because ultimately what we want at the, at the end of the day, what we want from our public transport systems is to be uh, more flexible and more easily uh, travel across space to access schools, employment, uh, healthcare services, uh, green areas, our family and friends and so on. So by far access to opportunities is a key benefit that we extract from public transport. And without a doubt, I think we would all agree that pollution on the other hand is one of the most important burdens that we get out of the transport systems. So while public transport systems give us the benefit of access, it also gives us the burden of this uh, intensive uh, flume, dark flumes with air pollution, which uh, have been widely recognized as a global problem for climate change, but also as a local threat for public health. And when we think about what are the data, the data available uh, and the tools available to analyze and visualize these two uh, phenomena, I like to say that there is a recent revolution in mobility data where we can use all sorts of GPS, mobile phone devices, smart cards, traffic cameras, portable emission uh, uh, monitors, and so on. And while a lot of people talk about these different data sets, I think much less attention is paid to what I like to call the quiet revolution of GTFS. GTFS, as many of you know, are, are the, is the global transit feed specification. And it's basically a standardized data format with geolocated timetables of the public transport system. And it has been ubiquitously used uh, across many different platforms, including Google Maps, Bing Maps, Moved, and so many other uh, companies. And most importantly, it has become the default standard of public transport data used over more than 600 cities across the globe. As we can see, Southeast Asia and Africa do not have as many cities on this map at the moment. But since the seminal work of uh, the digital Matatos that was led by Jackie Klopp and Sarah Williams, we have been seeing very, I'm very happy to see that we have been seeing a large number of initiatives trying to build GTFS data for many cities across the African continent. And what I, what I think is really revolutionary about GTFS data is because since it is a standard data format that is so widely used across the globe, GTFS creates a common ground for learning, which means that the tools that we develop to analyze GTFS data in Accra can be used to reflect and give insights about the public transport systems in Rio or New York or in, in Ghana or in Japan. So this is something that we've been trying to do in the projects that I'm involved in. And the first of them, is to develop what the, the a computational package called R5R that we are using to analyze access to opportunities. So R5R stands for Rapid Realistic Routing with R5 and R, and it basically allows you to do fast routing on multimodal public transport networks to calculate travel time distances, trip planning, isochrones, and accessibility, and so on. If you're familiar with Open Trip Planner, this is pretty much the same thing as Open Trip Planner, but a next generation or a next version of OTP. But it's much faster and incredibly more efficient due to uh, parallel computing. So once you have OpenStreetMap data, the GTFS feed of your city, and some information on the spatial distribution of schools, you only need two lines of code to run some accessibility analysis like this to estimate, for example, how many schools you could reach from each uh, city block within 20 minutes just by walking and taking public transport. I'm, ex I'm so excited about the R5R package that it, it has become the backbone of the Access to Opportunities project. So the AOP project is a project that I lead in Brazil where we do annual estimates of access to employment, schools and hospitals to Brazil's largest urban areas every year. And with R5R, we can estimate accessibilities in a very efficient way. So we can do over 1.6 billion queries in just a few hours. And you don't need a supercomputer to do this. With a regular computer for a mid-sized city, you can calculate accessibility in just a few minutes. And finally, uh, the other uh, tool that we've been developing is called GTFS to emiss This is an also a computational package. Uh, so this is an R package that provides a generalizable method to estimate public transport emissions from GTFS data. Uh, this package has not been released yet, 
but it will be coming soon, uh, uh, hope, we hope until the end of the year. And basically what this package does is it, it moves you from this boring GTFS static tables to more dynamic understandings of what is this, the, the spatial and temporal locations of every single vehicle on your GTF, of your GTFS feed, with, which combined with some additional information of, on, the, on the fleet characteristics, we can estimate uh, public transport emissions for every single vehicle at every single minute and location of the day. The only thing you need to do this is really a GTFS feed and a table that tells you what is the characteristics of your fleet, vehicle type, the fuel, and age. This could be either a detailed table telling you the, the characteristics of every single vehicle or just a general table with the overall fleet composition. Once you have these two inputs, you only need to select what are the pollutants you're interested about and select the emission factors that we will be using. For now, we have some emission factors from Brazil, Europe, and the United States, but we hope we will be expanding this soon uh, to other cities. And finally, just so you have an idea, because GTFS is a common format, we can easily calculate emissions, for example, in Houston, uh, Sydney, Australia, uh, Curitiba in Brazil, Rome in Italy, and many other cities. Uh, you can already see what are the spatial distribution of the large uh, capacity transport corridors where we have the highest concentration of air pollutants from uh, uh, tailpipe emissions. And uh, the, uh, the package opens up for a number of possibilities and applications. So we are currently writing a study during the environmental benchmark of comparing different systems across the globe. But you can also think about different policy scenarios, like what will be the environmental benefits if you, reno if you renovate some portion of your fleet or if, you're, or if you electrify certain routes of your public transport system. Uh, the outputs of this kind of analysis is also very paramount to think about what social and economic racial groups are more or less exposed to public transport pollution. Um, and I mean, there are numerous possibilities that we could uh, think about, but I lead you guys to think uh, what, how, what and can be done and how these two tools can be applied in your uh, uh, in your context, in your settings. That's it. Thank you very much, uh, Rafa. And uh, there are like a couple of questions here uh, that I see on uh, my questions and answer uh, box. Uh, so uh, like, uh, for example, for, For Abdurrahman, uh, what do you think? Like, uh, what what are like the most uh, what what are the challenges for uh, small startups in Africa? Like, uh, for example, we have uh, these mini grants that we are planning to give to uh, startups. And uh, what do you think the challenge uh, would be for startups in uh, data collection and uh, in the transportation sector in general? I think, uh, yeah, talking about the mini grant, I think for us, for example, one uh, main challenge was the uh, funding. So um, continue, sustainable funding, because we can have a grant to do mapping uh, one time and we can hire people to do this task. And then after the project ends, we'll have to find sustainable sources of income to keep this activity going and basically to keep ourselves uh, as an organization going. So funding definitely. So people have to look into different sources of funding for that. Um, I'd say the technical capacity and the human capacity in general. No, I think we have more than enough talent in African cities to to get the job done, basically. So yeah. That's that's wonderful, uh, Rahman. Uh, uh, one question that I see on the chat from the part from one of the panelists, Anna, is that uh, where do, it, it's for Rafa, and uh, she asked that where do uh, people can access the uh, emission measuring tool for uh, using GTFS in R? I, I know that uh, it's not still available in the market, but do you want to add? Uh, I'm not sure I understood the question, Agro. Could you repeat, please? Because yeah, Anna just asked that. Uh, she just uh, want to know where where to find the tool, the R package to measure oh, the emission. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, 
The GTFS to a MISTL has not been published yet. Uh, we will, uh, I hope we'll be publishing it by the end of the year and then we will make it available on GitHub and on CRAN. Uh, if you follow our website and our, on Twitter, uh, you will, I'll, I'll certainly be posting about it. The R5R package on the other hand is already published and I'll, I'll post the link on the chat box so you can have a look from those who are interested in. That's awesome. So uh, there's also one question from Antoine uh, to, uh, Enoch and uh, Enoch, uh, Antoine asked that, do you think that uh, OSM communities could maintain transport data through uh, crowdsourcing or is it too ambitious for uh, uh, the, the OSM communities to do that? Well, what, what, do you have anything to say on this? Yeah, I think I just responded in the chat, but I can say more. <laughs> uh, it might be uh, interesting to know that, yeah, it's not too ambitious, but uh, the model, the best model I've seen uh, in other parts of the world is uh, the city authorities uh, who are responsible for these routes, working hand in hand with uh, the OSM community. Someone in the city authority also have knowledge, the technical know-how that is the capacity building. If there is a data collection, there should be someone in the uh, authority, the department responsible for updating this uh, as well. Notwithstanding, volunteers will definitely fix issues when they come across them as well. Yeah. That's awesome. I think I hope uh, we answered uh, some of the questions where uh, it, it would have been like a very good uh, uh, if we can have uh, more in-depth uh, discussion on uh, this session, but unfortunately it looks like we went beyond time and uh, we have other uh, presentations on in line. So uh, I would like to thank all the speakers for this session and uh, we will uh, move on to the next session. Thank you. Thank you, Agro, um, and thank you to all Abdurrahman, Rafael, Enoch um, for the great presentations. We know there are some questions in the Q&A. So Abdurrahman, Rafael, and Enoch, if I can ask you to please uh, type the answers uh, in, in the Q&A box, if you could just get to those. If, uh, if we have time at the very end, we'll try to take a few questions then, um, but just for the sake of time. So I think, thank you for giving us a really good understanding of you know, really from the start, talking about data, talking about the tools, talking about how we can sort of map the transit and what are some of the uses that can come from that. So now I think I'll pass it on to um, Anna to introduce us to the session and her panelists to talk about what can be done with that data. Over to you, Anna. Um, thank you, Iman. So um, one of the objectives of this conference is to get people excited about collecting and using transportation data. And um, our session is called There's an App for That, um, because apps are one vehicle um, that, that data you know, can be developed to let people um, access data. So we're talking about the other side of the spectrum now, which is the user interface um, for the public. And um, as of January 2021, there were um, four and a half million apps on the market, uh, just Google Play and um, Apple. Uh, and about 2.5% of those apps are for transportation services. So that's like a little over 100,000 transport apps available on the market today. Um, what we're going to do in this panel is hear um, some of the, about the innovative apps that are um, being used in the region um, and other places and hear the story of how those apps came to be. Um, quickly though, a few housekeeping items. Um, we want you to ask questions. So I promise you I will be watching the chat and the Q&A and if you ask a question, we will address it. Um, the second is that um, each speaker will speak for six to seven minutes and then um, we'll have 10 minutes of Q&A at the end. And the third point is that the speakers want you to follow up with them. There, no one here is being paid to speak. So their, their interest is that they're growing their network and um, they're, they're building relationships. So we, we have our, everyone's email address on the slide. So you can you know, take a photo and, and if we were in a conference, we'd be having a coffee together. So please consider it um, that type of environment. Um, so we're first going to hear from um, Bertrand 
who um, is an expert in marketing and communications, um, and he's worked for most of his career in the IT sector. Um, he's currently the VP of communications at Kisio Digital, and they specialize in managing multimodal transportation data um, and developing you know, the end use apps. Um, he'll also talk about the Navitia Mobility Labs that, um, that they're piloting. Um, then we're going to be hearing, sorry, the order is mixed from Ahmed next. Um, Ahmed is an industrial engineer who's worked in operations and management for a range of companies um, throughout his career. And he's now the VP of strategy and planning for a very successful bus company in Egypt, Mwasalat Misr. And um, he's gonna talk about building um, transportation services with integrated um, app features. And then we'll hear from Christoph, um, who is actually um, an economist, founder of Trufi Association, as well as a CEO at Cubic, which specializes in um, data integration. So we have a lot of really smart people um, on the panel, and I'm going to kick off by hand. Uh, Ahmed can start, uh, yeah, and our connection is bit down now. Um, the last thing Anna wrote on our WhatsApp group internal is that Bertrand can start and then Ahmed and then myself, just in case. Okay. Yes, so, please. So I'm starting, uh, you, do you see my, my screen? No. Yes. Wait a minute. So I'm Bertrand working for Kizio Digital and I'm, I'm going to talk about Navicia Mobility Lab, yeah, open innovation, open transport toolbox. Uh, Kizio is part of Keoli's group, uh, SNCF group. Um, ah, ah, sorry, ah, um, I will do it in, uh, in French. Uh, uh, Est-ce que ça va si je parle en français? J'avais dit que je le faisais en français, c'est pour ça. Donc, euh, est-ce que vous m'entendez la traduction Et j'ai commencé à le faire en anglais. J'ai entendu trop d'anglais, c'est pour ça. Donc, euh, je travaille chez euh, chez Kizio et euh, donc voilà, on a on édite une plateforme euh, de, de 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 mobilité qui s'appelle Navicia pour faire des, des calculs d'itinéraires, de l'information voyageur. Euh, on est basé en France et on travaille avec des acteurs de, dans le monde entier. Donc, Navicia, c'est un logiciel comme Open Trip Planner qui est en open source depuis 2014. Il y a plein de fonctionnalités, des cartes isochrones, euh, de calcul d'itinéraire, des prochains passages, euh, de, de géocoding aussi. Et donc, euh, il y a beaucoup de gens qui l'utilisent. On, on a plus de 10 000 développeurs qui sont connectés à notre API navicia.io. Euh, donc, l'idée, c'est de vous parler d'innovation de, de, ouverte, de création de valeur et de voir qu'en fait, il y a toujours une application pour faire quelque chose et parfois, il y en a même beaucoup plus. Euh, donc, comme on, je ne sais pas comment est votre, votre écran de, de smartphone, mais le mien, il y a beaucoup d'applications. Je ne les utilise pas souvent. Euh, souvent, j'utilise utilise la même, mais euh, on finit par s'y perdre. Et, et donc, il y a beaucoup d'applications, mais il n'y a pas beaucoup d'élus finalement. Euh, si on regarde les usages, euh, mais bon, est-ce que c'est un problème Peut-être que c'est bien qu'il y ait beaucoup d'applications puisque ça adresse aussi des niches. Donc, si on regarde les applications, je vous ai mis quelques use cases qui utilisent euh, Navicia, euh, soit notre API, soit des Software Development Kit, des SDK mobiles. Donc, vous avez des applications comme l'application SNCF qui fait du porte-à-porte. -porte, euh, donc, c'est du Mobility as a Service. Vous avez des applications comme MAPI qui compare des itinéraires. Vous avez des applications comme Transporter qui, euh, qui, qui, qui calcule des itinéraires dans les heures de passage, mais qui respectent la vie privée des gens et qui ne sont, euh, sont pas du tout intrusifs comme d'autres applications. Vous avez des applications de smart parking comme Parking Map. Vous avez des chatbots qui ne sont pas vraiment des applications, mais qui utilisent Facebook Messenger, WeChat ou WhatsApp. Et puis, vous avez aussi des robots qui peuvent vous donner de l'information voyageur pour vous aider à vous déplacer dans les gares. 
Si on regarde maintenant une autre application intéressante, c'est une application qui a été développée dans la ville de Rennes. Ça s'appelle Star l'appli. Et là, ce n'est pas vraiment une application de transport. C'est une application, moi j'appelle ça City as a Service. C'est une application multiservice pour les villes. Et dedans, vous avez la météo, vous avez les bars, les restaurants, tout un tas de points d'intérêt intéressants qu'on peut aller récupérer sur OpenStreetMap d'ailleurs. Et puis après, bah, vous allez pouvoir déclencher des itinéraires. Là, je vous ai mis un cas d'usage où je vais manger un burger au restaurant Food Burger. Et donc, j'ai mon itinéraire qui vient récupérer l'information formation sur Navicia. Un autre exemple développé par la même, la même entreprise, donc là c'est un intégrateur qui fait cette application qui s'appelle Orange Business Service, c'est une application pour les universités de Normandie. En région Normandie en France, il y a 70 000 étudiants et donc c'est le même principe, c'est une, une application avec plein de services pour les étudiants. Donc vous avez les restaurants universitaires, les amphithéâtres, les salles de cours et comment se déplacer sur le territoire quand on est étudiant. Euh, une autre application que je trouve intéressante, donc là, ce n'est pas une application, c'est un objet connecté, c'est une canne connectée pour les, les aveugles, les, les personnes malvoyantes. Et euh, quand elles approchent d'un arrêt de bus, ça vient leur donner le prochain passage du bus. Donc, on voit aussi que les objets connectés, même s'il n'y a pas d'écran, c'est aussi utile pour aider à se déplacer. Je change complètement de sujet, l'immobilier. Quand vous êtes dans l'immobilier, quand vous cherchez un appartement, une maison, vous voulez acheter, vous avez besoin de savoir combien ça coûte, où sont les appartements et les maisons qui font une pièce, deux pièces, trois pièces sur le territoire. Donc là, c'est un exemple en Ile-de-France, à Paris. Et vous pouvez filtrer avec le temps de transport, l'accès en temps de transport avec Navicia. Donc là, j'ai mis 40 minutes de temps de transport pour aller travailler aux 20 rues de Villiers. Et quels sont les appartements que je peux trouver avec mon budget et le nombre de pièces Donc ça devient un outil d'aide à la décision. Dans le même principe, vous avez John Slang Lassalle, qui est un acteur de l'immobilier d'entreprise, qui aide les entreprises à trouver les meilleurs locaux pour leurs salariés et qui regarde les meilleurs temps de transport en fonction de où habitent les salariés pour qu'ils aillent travailler avec le moins de transport possible. Ça, c'est le même type d'exemple. C'est une start-up qui s'appelle 1 km à pied, qui fait des plans de déplacement entreprise pour les salariés des entreprises. Ça, c'est un grand magasin. Donc, c'est l'application du magasin. Et pour vous dire comment aller à votre magasin préféré, vous avez un bouton. Vous pouvez y aller en Uber, en voiture ou en transport en commun. Donc, le bouton transport en commun, c'est connecté aussi à Navicia. Ça, c'est un exemple intéressant aussi, c'est l'emploi. L'accès à l'emploi sur le territoire, c'est un sujet très important. C'est le ministère de l'Emploi français qui a créé une start-up d'État qui s'appelle La Bonne Boîte. Et eux, en fait, ils vous, ils vous mettent sur une carte les, les emplois autour de chez vous à X minutes d'accès de chez vous. Donc là, par exemple, je cherche un emploi de styliste et j'habite à Paris, place Clichy, en 30 minutes de transport en commun. Tous les points que vous voyez sur la carte, ce sont des recherches d'emploi, des annonces d'emploi de stylistes. Même exemple avec une autre start-up qui s'appelle Bim Bam Job. C'est à peu près la même chose. Vous pouvez, vous pouvez filtrer les annonces en fonction du temps de transport et avoir que les annonces qui sont à 45 minutes de chez vous. Euh, et ça, c'est un exemple que je trouve assez rigolo. C'est euh, un peu comme le, le Tinder. C'est une appli de rencontre en, qui utilise les transports en commun et qui va vous dire où, euh, où se trouvent euh, la, 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 les personnes qui vous plaît le plus proche en transport en commun. Donc, l'idée, c'est de voir un petit peu c'est quoi la différence de, 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 de Navicia ou d'autres logiciels open source comme Open Tree Planner. C'est de proposer aussi, euh, alors pas du café comme le Nespresso, mais euh, tout un tas d'outils. Moi, j'appelle ça une boîte à outils euh, pour aider euh, d'autres acteurs à innover et pour leur faire gagner du temps et, et pas les contraindre à utiliser juste une API euh, qui serait payante au bout d'un moment en fonction des usages. Donc, l'idée, c'est vraiment, nous, on est un acteur du service public. Donc, du coup, on utilise aussi l'argent public en partie. On n'a pas que, mais on a aussi des, des clients privés. Mais du coup, on, on pense que c'est important de travailler pour l'intérêt général, développer des communs et garantir une certaine souveraineté euh, et, et, et aussi ce qu'on appelle l'empowerment, c'est-à-dire de, de, de la capacité euh, d'un maximum de gens à créer des choses intéressantes euh, pour des citoyens. Et puis, à partager, à partager tout ça donc dans, une, dans une boîte à outils avec différents outils techniques. Déjà, le logiciel open source qu'on peut télécharger, installer, euh, si on veut être complètement indépendant. L'API navicia.io, 
Euh, avec l'Open Data Bar, si on veut juste télécharger les jeux de données Open Data, on peut aussi le faire. Euh, on a 650 jeux de données du monde entier. Et puis après, on a une petite console qui s'appelle Navicia Playground, qui fait gagner du temps aussi aux développeurs. C'est euh, un petit site euh, très utile. Et puis, on a développé aussi une, une partie widget pour tout ce qui est site web. Et puis après, des SDK pour les gens qui veulent faire des applications mobiles, SDK itinéraire, SDK autour de moi. Finalement, ce qu'on a fait depuis 2013-2014, le moment où on est passé en open source avec Navicia, on s'est dit, on va le mettre à disposition d'autres gens pour qu'eux puissent puisse aussi proposer tout ça sur des territoires, notamment en Afrique. Donc, on a créé ce qu'on appelle le laboratoire des mobilités qui reprend tous ces outils, toute cette boîte à outils et qui peut être mis avec le logo d'une autorité de transport ou d'un acteur du transport ou d'une entreprise privée même. Donc en Afrique, qu'est-ce qui se passe Donc bientôt à Abidjan, il y aura un laboratoire des mobilités euh, qui sera euh, basé sur Navicia, sur des données open data qui proviennent notamment d'OpenStreetMap aussi. Euh, et donc c'est un projet qui regroupe différents acteurs et qui sera, euh, qui sera bientôt en, en production. Ça va être lancé à l'automne. C'est déjà prêt. Ça se présente comme une plateforme Internet et dessus, bah, vous avez accès à des ressources, des données, des SDK, des API et vous pouvez après l'utiliser pour créer d'autres applications. Donc là, par exemple, c'est déjà, alors ce n'est pas encore en production, mais je vous montre un exemple. Je pars d'un point pour aller à un autre point à Abidjan et j'ai un itinéraire intermodal où je vais prendre du vélo, un bus, un bateau et je vais finir en marche à pied. Donc, c'était pour vous montrer que c'est très facile à, à déployer et que ça se, ça, ça, après, c'est toute une partie d'animation de la communauté qui est importante à faire en organisant des événements et euh, en faisant connaître aussi ces ressources. Sinon, si personne ne les utilise, ça ne servira à rien. Donc, voilà. Donc, l'idée, c'est de, de dire que bah, finalement, on propose de l'open source, de l'open data et aussi de l'open service, mais qu'on n'enferme pas les gens juste avec euh, de l'open service et que tout est possible. Voilà, merci beaucoup. Thank you, Bertrand. Um, we'll, we'll now hand it over to Ahmed. <coughs> Thank you very much. Just briefly share the screen and make sure that everybody can hear me fine and uh, my screen is showing. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so, so far, extremely uh, inspiring presentations. Um, I'll run briefly, just to run some context and then uh, give our take on that. Uh, Mosalot Misr is a, uh, um, an international uh, group of companies working currently in Cairo, Egypt. And uh, this presentation is co-powered by one of our partners, LIT Transit, which is a solution provider. Um, We are working in Cairo, Egypt, with where there are like 25 million daily trips are made by all modes combined. That's an estimate from 2019. And that makes Cairo one of the hottest cities for mobility in general, because it's a mega city that people come in for job opportunities every day from outside of it. And this mega city is served by multiple, multiple modes. Um, it has anything from subway network up to regulated and unregulated uh, paratransit uh, models. And these models uh, have always been divided into mainly two groups, a group that is available for the poorer segment of the community that comes with a low cost, a low fare, but, but comes with that with low convenience and service quality. And the other group comes with a higher quality, but it's inaccessible to the majority of people. And there has always been a gap uh, for the middle class that has drawn them away from using public transport and made them uh, and drawn a stigma against public transport. Most, but most now runs a network of 63 bus routes that intersect with the subway network at 18 metro stations. Uh, and we mainly focus on connecting the satellite cities or what we call new urban communities outside of central Old Cairo into Old Cairo. And we do that by almost 300 buses and an annual uh, capacity of transporting three, 32 million people. The group consists of operational companies and supporting companies, uh, one focus in mobility technologies and service and advertising to generate out of fare box revenues for the group. And now, 
uh, we operate based on three contracts with different uh, um, entities from the Egyptian government. Um, but what we do, and this will be the next section of the presentation, is that the normal user or the normal uh, passenger does not know about the contractual models, and it's a seamless experience at the end of the day. All our uh, vehicles are uh, typical to what you would see in any major European city. They have onboard Wi-Fi, CCTV cameras, they are accessible uh, for wheelchairs and other disabilities. Uh, and uh, that has enabled us to become a member of UITP, which is the International Union for Public Transport. Uh, what, but this was the easy part. The easy part was investing in the fleet and getting a, a good standard fleet. But the really difficult challenge where we face every day is the cultural shift for the service provider, the drivers themselves, the conductors, the station supervisors, as well as the passengers themselves. For, for instance, one of the things that we faced in the, in the very beginning of operations is that all public buses in Cairo are, uh, the onboarding happens from the rear door and the alighting happens from the front door. And uh, for us, it's the opposite. There is no collector at the rear door. This caused a lot of confusion. And one of the things that are extremely uh, distinct to uh, this kind of setup, which is common across Africa, is that the fares are collected manually, either in like matatus or microbuses, uh, the fares are collected by the passengers themselves, or they are collected by a, an official collector with a, printed, uh, with a printed copy. And I will come to back later because for the most part, the fares for public transportation in Cairo are uh, flat fares. What we did is that we have launched a standard a prepaid uh, contactless card. It's a card-based system. It's typical to what you would see in most major cities. Uh, it's also compatible with the technology for uh, the subway. It has not been integrated yet, but it is on the way. The thing that we have done is that instead of investing in um, leveraging the uh, devices where you could top up these cards, we have integrated with one of the local players in the Egyptian market that provides points of sale at uh, convenience stores and supermarkets and kiosks where people can top up their cards. And now people can top up their cards at at least three locations from within uh, their, their uh, alighting and onboarding stops. Another system is that since we have fair collection, this has enabled us to monitor uh, the transactions that are being made on the buses in near real time. And this helps us in the analysis and I will get to that in a minute. Um, because of all what I've, this, uh, what, all I've mentioned is that this is a typical legacy uh, public transport system that is quite unusual for the major African city. Most African cities rely on, and Cairo in specific, they rely on micro buses or what you call matatos or taxis. And it's a, it's a common setting that you see uh, across Africa. And these ones, the main characteristic that's common between them is that they do not leave the terminal station until they are completely full. They do not work on service schedules. They do not work on timetables. They work on fill and go. And this fill and go model has actually changed how the city operates and how the city works. For example, if you want to go from your home, some uh, microbus lines run across this route, you wouldn't be able to just take it from home and go to school. What you would have to do is that you would need to go to the microbus station via some other mode of transportation, wait there, and then take the bus from the terminal up to your final destination. This has caused two things. One longer trips. Two, it has caused what we would call phantom trips, unnecessary trips that are made usually to the city center to the terminal of the microbus. And this has made that the stops physically in the middle of the streets constructed by the government are mostly deserted and people leave them and go take the bus from the main terminal station. What we have done at Moslot Mos is that we have actually collected the data the support from the beautiful people of Transport for Cairo and other entities to map the virtual bus stops, the points of interest where people actually take the bus. And we've collected the data on 1,435 bus stops. 60% of, of them are virtual. And we have included these bus stops into our network. And since we have the stops and we have the fare collection devices, we started doing some analysis on the data and we saw that 
even though we have this, even though we have that, even though we don't ha we have the non-flat fare to make the people take the bus from the middle of the road, people are still taking the bus from the terminal. As you can see on the bottom two uh, graphs, this is the number of passengers taking the bus on a certain route. And this is a, just a, a quantitative sample by the order of the bus stop on this route. And as you can see, extremely people are taking the bus from the beginning of the route. And so at Moslot Muscle, we've decided to put our extreme focus on scheduled adherence through monitoring. Through the solutions that we're using from LIT, LIT Monitor, we are keen to monitor the schedule adherence and communicate with the drivers in real time to make sure that the schedules are actually met. And since we have uh, AI powered uh, ETA, these, ET these AI powered ETAs have enabled us to decrease the variance between schedule times and operating times from 15 minutes at the beginning of the deployment of operations into three minutes and 20 seconds on average on each and every stop in the network. This is great. But since we do that, we were the one of the first ones to integrate our services on Google Maps in real time in Africa and the Middle East. So Google Maps with the standard legacy GTFS engine that they have, it's accessible to everyone, but it, it is quite rigid. And the users in Cairo, since schedules are not really in the mentality, what they really need to do to see is when is my bus arriving? So what we've decided is that we developed our own mobile application inspired by many applications out there that are customized to our uh, setup and only use the show the users the end result that they need. And we've also integrated that on WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger um, to, to get the people to know wh when the bus is coming because this is what's actually driving people away from taking the bus from the middle of the road. Not only that, LIT solutions are actually uh, hardware agnostic. So we have three sets of hardware on board of the buses with three different softwares, but all of them speak into LIT portal. And this LIT portal with the real-time ETE engine that's AI powered is capable of communicating this to multiple platforms such as our own app, Google Maps, and the others. So in short, and this is the last slide, there shouldn't be an app for that. There should be multiple systems for that. There should be multiple apps and solutions as well as legacy systems such as digital screens and printed timetables so that people can monitor the buses in real time and get on the bus. Thank you very much. And sorry for exceeding my time by a few seconds. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, uh, we have a lot of questions for you, Ahmed. So um, you'll get to talk again, don't worry. Um, Christoph, I'm handing it to you. Thanks a lot. Um, I would share my screen. Excellent. Here we go. Yes, I'm very happy to present as well, uh, represent the Trophy Association and talk about how we go beyond mapping and um, also continuing a bit what Enoch said just one hour ago, who was part of our project or we were part of his project. Um, excellent. Here we go. Um, oops. Here we go. What is Trophy Association? We are an international um, NGO um, that's uh, based in different countries. Um, besides me in Hamburg, people are from Africa, South America, Asia, and we are all working together on a journey planner um, that works on informal transport, actually also on semi-formal and formal transport, as you can see later. It's multi-model um, and it's um, working in all that areas where um, you would not need uh, where there are stops, if there are any schedules, um, you all know this kind of transport. Um, just this homage to Bolivian trophies or micros um, that, that uh, we, um, people where we started in Cochabamba um, use a lot. Where are we now? Our journey planner went open source and that gave us the possibility to really distribute into many other places and countries. Um, Anok was one of the people that went with us to Accra, uh, where uh, the GTFS had been created. Most of you guys know this already. 
then Addis Abeba, Tetuan, Cochabamba, Duitama, and recently also two cities in Germany, Herrenberg and Hamburg, are getting our journey planner because, as you know, it's um, multimodal, so also interesting for them. Um, but um, Anna asked me um, about my presentation that I really come with problems and what was the solution. Um, so our first problem in all the cities was where do the buses go? Uh, what's my best option? Of course, mapping is what you have heard already yesterday. Um, and we just did this in the city of Nokchot. If you are at the state of the map uh, 2021 conference next week, you will hear our presentation on this. Really interesting doing this remotely with a local team during a pandemic um, together with the World Bank. So um, first thing you have to do, of course, is to map public transport, put it to GDFS. And then you need a um, person like Leonardo that you can see on the screen uh, that knows how to create GTFS from OSM with OSM to GTFS or with other our own data tools, also open source actually, uh, we, can, we can do this. And if you have this um, up and running in an open trip planner, for example, uh, there's an app um, to answer the questions, where are the bus going? Um, so we, um, this app, um, can be used and delivered to many cities. It can be customized um, and um, can be really put into the local context with its own features, its own color, its own name, be it Matatu app, uh, Jeepney app, or uh, Dala Dala app. Um, that's how it is made for. So there is an app um, for public transport. It's open source, works on iPhones, Androids, also on the old ones, really important, um, with uh, low requirements uh, for the end users. So no need um, to create a new one, uh, a new app. You can also use our open source Trophy Core and release it in your city or be a partner with us and bring it to your city with our help. Um, so that's maybe already known if you know Trophy, but there's also more questions we are working with. Uh, one question is, how can we make public transport better? What you can see here is the city of Cachabamba in Bolivia. Um, and you can see where many people in that moment um, used Trophy app um, and, uh, and send a short spot. And um, so our idea is um, cities can make public transport better if they know where are users, where, from where to where go users. Uh, what needs do they have? And when is our search result bad? Like you have to change three buses or two gondolas or whatever. Um, so maybe we should make the public network better at that point. Um, this is what we are doing with our analytics. Um, this, for example, is showing just origin destination um, searches. And of course, if you <clears throat> use different tools, you can really um, Give, give good insights to, to city uh, decision makers. Actually, we just had a call last week with the city in Peru. And the only reason for them to launch Trophy App or like with the local name, of course, uh, in their city uh, is to do better transport planning for the population. And I think this is very valuable and one of the biggest uh, benefits because in the end, public transport serves the majority of the people and it helps our climate goals. Other questions that we had is, uh, when comes my trophy? That is also what we just heard in the last session. So what about, where is it right now? If there are no schedules, I want to know if I have to wait two or five minutes and whether it has space. There's an app for that. <laughs> uh, we developed um, an app for the drivers um, so that they, um, could share their position and that they could say, I'm full right now. So this enables the users to know uh, when comes the next bus that has space. Um, in each city, I think it will be important to find a good reason for the driver to use this. So in the city of Cochabamba during the uh, pandemic, we said if a, if a driver is using it and he's full, full meant during Corona times 50% full, he can shortcut his route. So he really had a benefit 
of course, making payment could be a different other benefit. So in whatever city we are, we have to find good reasons for the drivers to use the app, share the position, and we have a very cheap and good way to indicate the user also uh, when really the next bus comes and when his estimated time of arrival is and what really is the best option to use now. Another um, interesting question um, is really how to keep also the network, the bus lines up to date in the long run. Many open data projects um, got an investment, did the analysis, but then what, what's one year later, two years later? Um, from Transport for Cairo, we already heard that they are exactly working in that area as well. Our cities as well, of course, um, because nothing is as um, disappointing as an outdated um, schedule or network, uh, and you're relying on that one. Um, so there's an app for that, or at least there's a feature for that in Trophy app. Um, so we, we are using now the power of the users um, that indicate us if a route is missing or if it's outdated. So they can to start to track their route. Um, it's following their route. It's continuing their route. And at some point the user says, okay, I'm leaving the bus. I stopped tracking. The information is shared with us. And we have a team of people um, OSM experts that would then uh, look at the different um, trackings and would um, adapt OpenStreetMap so that the networks is accurate in the long run. So, but how to earn money with an app? So that's a very funny question for an NGO since we don't have to earn money, but of course we need a business model as well. Um, and we have a business, we are concerned about the business model of our partners that want to earn money uh, in the different cities in South America and Africa. Um, so the, the biggest thing is really support the city um, with, with the users to give them information, uh, helping with analytics, um, also using Trophy app or the app as a channel for their policies. Um, for if if they if the city wants to indicate educate uh, people through the app reach out to them um, ask for their feedback on public transport so i think that's um, the biggest thing where we can earn money with the app um, to bring it into a city customize it for the city run it in the long run for the city um, and also keep the network updated that's also interesting because many cities have signed a contract with google if they are on Google Maps and for seven years, they have to keep their GTFS accurate. How, what's the cheapest option to do this? Give a journey planner where users um, indicate um, the current lines. So people don't have to do this, just maybe check it from time to time. Another way is to do ticket payment, mobility as a service. Um, we are still looking for the first city that would like to do this with Trophy, just in case you're interested. We already have our ideas, just didn't have a city that wants to do it. Um, and of course, also things like advertisement, partnering with local businesses, like showing a location-based advertisement, um, working with drivers, agencies, are all ideas how you can earn money with the app. Um, which interested, for example, did this city have? The city of Herrenberg in Germany, um, they, for example, they really wanted uh, to make their publication population use uh, the very new options of modern public transport, uh, where you can see here in the map, not only the results from, from our app, you can also see where are parking slots? Where where is a park and ride? Where is a where where is a bicycle station? Where are electronic loading um, stations? So all this information is now like in a channel, uh, like in a marketing channel, uh, uh, trans um, transported from the city to their population, and it helps people to uh, leave the car at home or not buy a car and use really the variety of um, modern transport. Or what interest did this city have, the city of Hamburg, where, we, um, where we're just launching a public transport um, planner for cyclists. And it tells the cyclist how he can combine with ferry, uh, with train and shortcut on his way 
because yeah, results are totally different from a cyclist um, that's using public transport. And the interest here is to make cycling more favorable, uh, show how cycling and public transport can interact um, and also motivate people to really use the bike when they go to the city instead of a car. So I hope I could uh, bring some of the ideas uh, what you can do beyond mapping. Of course, we are also mapping, but I mean, interesting, the most interesting part for us is like digital solutions beyond mapping, uh, questions that can arrive and yeah, apps that already exist and that you, are, that you can use. Thanks a lot for your attention. Looking forward to the question session. Thank you, Christoph. Um, so I'm gonna ask all the panelists to unmute and put their video on. And um, I'm taking the risk of getting my colleagues angry at me because we're a bit over, but I'd like to cover just a few questions if that's okay. Um, I'm sorry for the next panel. So um, the first question, maybe we can be very quick. Uh, Christoph asked it himself, how can apps make money? And I would like um, Ahmed and um, Bertrand just to give a quick answer to that since Christoph already uh, did. The short answer is advertising, uh, and um, that, that, that's the short answer, location-based advertising. Great, thank you. Bertrand, what have you seen? Um, I think it's difficult to make money with um, mobility features, uh, even if it's uh, useful, but um, uh, if you... Um, it, some firms want to uh, make money with the data, with the data sets, with the, uh, because they, they, they know who, who you are and uh, where you are going for maybe for what to do. <laughs> uh, it's a bit scary. Um, they can sell this personal data, not in all the countries. Uh, well, in Europe, uh, there are rules about uh, GDPR personal data but uh, it it could they could be business around with uh, with uh, the acceptance of uh, of people um, but uh, it's difficult to make money uh, I, I saw that uh, WIM which is a European uh, startup doing mass and uh, is uh, is going very bad uh, and Ubigo uh, was going very bad uh, six months ago so it's not so easy, even if they have a lot of money because they are funded by um, uh, hedge funds, um, VCs. Uh, so they have a lot of money, but uh, they don't have business model. And uh, they, they find, uh, they, they try to find a, a model, but it's quite hard. Um, I saw that uh, uh, City Maper, for example, they, they collect money with uh, crowdfunding. <laughs> um, well, uh, are you ready uh, to do that? Um, personally, uh, I, I won't do that for City Maper. If, if it was a foundation uh, like uh, Mozilla, like uh, Wikipedia, like OpenStreetMap, or you know, yeah, an NGO, and maybe I, I could do that because uh, it's important for, for the people. Uh, but if it's a private, uh, private firm and uh, I'm not sure it's a, it's a good point. Is it, is it okay, my answer? Uh, maybe we lost Anna again, uh, just in case there are more questions. Uh, Christoph, I, I don't see any questions um, in the chat. I think there were some that um, I think most of you already answered it via chat, but uh, what we can do is, uh, since we're short on time, I know Anna had, okay, Anna, you're back. I'm sorry. Oh, no um, problem. The bad Friday evenings are the worst <laughs> for the internet connections in Kampala. Okay. Um, maybe just one more question, if that's okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so someone asked, um, they'd like to get a sense from Ahmed, 
what the cost to set up the system he presented um, and whether it's viable expense to be replicated by other companies in other cities? Well, uh, there is no short answer for that, uh, unfortunately, but uh, um, the media <laughs> technology is getting cheaper every day and um, African context does not require, uh, for example, EMV reading, the visa cards, the contactless cards, the QR, the, the sophisticated stuff that is usually enforced by the regulator in, in, uh, in Europe or in, in Asia are not required by the government here in Africa. So technology is getting cheaper. Um, you can get simple point of sale devices that work just as good as legacy old devices from well-known suppliers. And it will work and it will suffice the data. It will trans. It, it will have uh, the APIs, the necessary technology to send the passenger information as well as manage uh, fare collection. Uh, so depending on what the requirements are, it can get really expensive and be inaccessible. But if you need just the basic stuff, you can go under, I would say, $200, $300 per bus, and then with a simple um, with a simple fee every month. Th this can work for, for the local context if the requirements are quite basic. Thank you. I was thinking you were going to avoid a, a price tag, but that's very helpful. Yeah. Um, and maybe one last very short question. Um, for, for It was geared toward Ahmed, but I think, Christoph, I would like to hear your answer to this too. Um, you know, do you have you heard of any USSD or SMS based um, trip planning services that people who don't have a smartphone might be able to use? Um, so for Antananarivo and Mali, we uh, we already pitched the idea and did the architecture, uh, but we didn't find the funding. So maybe that's our approach for for the fund uh, to do this with the local partner. Just in uh, case, please con. If I may like add, uh, the, the, the key problem why USSD or SMS-based uh, solutions might not be able to work perfectly in the African context is not in the technology. For, for USSD or SMS to work without having a location sharing, without a smartphone, there needs to be some sort of identity or a key where you map the data to, like a bus code for a bus stop code, for example. And bus stops do not exist, and bus stop codes subsequently do not exist. This is the main roadblock. So the main focus now is to how to have an infrastructure of a network of bus stops that are coded, that are somehow identified. And if you can do this, the actual incremental costs to do that via the mobile operators will be extremely cheap, in my opinion. OK. Thank you. Um, I'm going to have to wrap it up now, but the panelists have promised they're going to review the question box and respond individually to all of the questions. Uh, we got a lot of great questions, and I'm sad to cut the conversation short, um, but the next session is good. So thank you. Uh, back to Amon. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we're going to take a short five-minute break, um, and then we'll be we'll meet back here for the last two sessions that we have. So thank you to all the panelists, to the speakers, and Anna for your great moderation. Um, I think it was a great sort of uh, linkage between session one and session two. You could see even within the experiences from the mapping that was done with OpenStreet Maps through Enoch and the connection to what Christoph presented, and similarly with TFC and Mosalat Misr. So just to show that there are very strong linkages and it is possible to go beyond and that once you have the app, it really opens many opportunities and unlocks the power to, to sort of many other projects. So for the next half of the session, we'll be having a discussion on big data that'll be moderated by Sarah Williams and then end uh, with a really great session on what are some of the impacts that we want to see on the ground um, with a great uh, session that'll be moderated by Gasha from ITDP. So I'll see you back here in, in a little less than five minutes. Thank you, everyone.
Hey, welcome back, everybody. Sorry we had to cut the break um, short, but we just wanted to make up for the time. I think the discussions were you know, worth going a little bit over time, they always are. Um, so Sarah, I'll pass it to you to get, to get us started on session three on big data incoming. Over to you, Sarah. Great, everyone. Um, so wonderful being here with you all today. Um, so I want to start, um, given that we're a little bit short on time, what I'd like to start by doing is putting um, the bios of all the panelists um, in the chat and I'll um, put the link in um, the question and answer section so you guys can see that, um, or sorry, in the, in the regular uh, chat uh, room. Uh, so that everybody can see that um, as we get started. But what I will do is first just uh, briefly introduce everyone um, and then please do check out their longer bios um, in the bio section online. So we are very lucky to have uh, Philip Krauser um, that's been working uh, with the Go Essential African Urban Mobility Observatory, an FCDO funded research project, which aims to establish new mobility data collection techniques using existing and therefore affordable mobility technology and infrastructure in six African citizen cities. Sorry. Um, and then George Kabbalah Bauer, who is a senior advocacy and insights manager in the digital utilities program at GSMA and has been doing a lot of work uh, looking at mobility data that can be taken from mobile operators and he'll be talking with us about that today. And then we also have Jeremy Nintambe um, who um, has really done a lot of work in Kambala to create data um, and essential data on infrastructure. Um, please do see their longer bios. Um, I'll start by inviting uh, Philip uh, to speak. Um, and thank you, Philip. Wait, there we go. Is that, can you hear me now? Yes. OK, great. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. OK, fantastic. Let me just put it full screen and dive straight in. So the Africa Urban Mobility Observatory. Um, firstly, it's a, let me just introduce it quickly. It's a, a UK aid funded research project, part of the second phase of FCDO's High Volume Transport Applied Research Program. Um, the, it's led by uh, the following consortium partners, which is Go Sandal and Go Metro. Uh, in the lead, and then UN Habitat, Wuppertal Institute, and UEMI supporting. In terms of the research questions that this um, program aims to address, the first is what are the main levers for transport mode share and what is the role of data? What cities have achieved high or low transit ridership, cycling, etc., and what factors, policies explain the differences? The second question is what are the op opportunities and risks of big data applications in the global in global south cities? And then finally, what is the role of informal transport in the Global South and how to enable a transition towards clean and affordable and efficient uh, transport solutions? So the Africa Urban Mobility Observatory, what is it all about? Um, firstly, it's been conducted, it's research that's been conducted in, in the six cities listed here. So it's Blantai, Gaborone, Kigali, Kinshasa, Lagos, and Maseru. And um, as you can see in this diagram, um, essentially, it's a, it's a data collection exercise or it's a, it's, a, it's a research project in which we want to find new ways of collecting data using existing technologies or telecommunications technologies um, so that we can uh, understand the mobility patterns in these cities um, where more conventional methods of collecting data such as household travel surveys are just too costly to conduct. Um, and that's why we want to leverage these existing technologies in, in these new ways. Um, so essentially what happens is you have, um, you, what we do is we track uh, willing participants um, and their data is then uh, interpreted by our uh, big data environment. And then it gets uploaded into a online web data platform 
where it is published for local planning authorities and anyone who wishes to view the data to basically delve in and, and, and understand what the mobility patterns are in the various cities and across different demographic profiles. And um, the data that we collect uh, in, informs the, the indicators that you can see over here in the bottom left corner. Um, in terms of data collection tools, so one of the, the main data collection tools that we have deployed is called User Movement Analytics, or UMA for short. It's a smartphone app-based um, tool which integrates with uh, existing smartphone apps, and we can also deploy it as a standalone app, but ultimately uh, we're trying to reach a diverse and large sample. Uh, so, you know, integrating with existing apps that have existing user bases is a way to, to leverage those, those, those larger user bases in those cities that already exist. Um, now, one key uh, challenge that we had to face is making sure that we comply with GDPR, so General Data Protection Regulations. So what we do to ensure we comply is, uh, firstly, users are informed uh, that they may participate if they wish to. Um, we explain to them what the data will be used for, and if they wish to participate, then we track them. If they don't, then they don't get tracked. Also, their, their personal details or, or you know, uh, profiles are not actually linked to the data that we collect. Instead, we ask them to fill out a disaggregation survey so that we can understand uh, what uh, the demographic profile is so that we can still disaggregate the data after the fact. Now, obviously, um, in the context of Africa, smartphone penetration is relatively limited. So we do have other data collection tools as well. And uh, those include the USSD surveys, which I saw uh, came up in one of the questions. Um, we also have WhatsApp surveys, web surveys, and then more conventional intercept surveys, which are the face-to-face -face surveys that are conducted at ranks and bus stops, et cetera. So the, the USSD surveys and the WhatsApp surveys, to, they're interactive surveys uh, where we um, essentially market the survey by sending out uh, SMSs, bulk SMSs to users in certain zones uh, so that we can ensure we, we, we can uh, achieve our target sample. Um, and, and we ask them to participate. And we're also investigating the possibility of introducing incentives such as airtime vouchers or entries into competitions to encourage people, people to participate. Um, and then finally, the intercept surveys, we still have to conduct those because not everyone has a, a, a cell phone at all. Um, but the, the nice thing about USSD is that it does function on, on older 2G cell phones from the 90s even. Um, so it's a have a much uh, a better chance of, of, of capturing that uh, sample that maybe doesn't have a smartphone. Then finally, as I mentioned, uh, the data visualization platform, all that data gets uploaded into this, this web platform where the, the information gets visualized in graphs and maps uh, so that basically you can better understand uh, how people are traveling and the experiences um, according to the various demographic profiles. So we, we disaggregate by age and gender and income level, uh, travel time, et cetera. Thanks for your time. And yeah, please feel free to contact me at any point. Uh, there's my email address and I'm sure it'll be shared elsewhere as well. Uh, yeah, I look forward to answering any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Philip. Um, I would like to now invite um, George to speak. Um, George, would you like to share your screen? Yes, no problem. Um. I'll be sharing my entire screen. Sorry about that. Um, you should be seeing my screen now, yes? Yes. Oh, no, we are not, actually. Oh, no? No. OK. Um, could I ask somebody else to share? Um, I sent the slides to, um, I think, uh, Agra, um, if you don't mind sharing them, and I'll go next. I'm getting an error message when I try to share them. Sure, George, we'll, we're working on it. We'll pull it up. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. 
can. Sorry about the technical difficulties. <laughs> Uh, Sarah, maybe Jeremy can go and until we pull up. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Um, no, that, yeah, yeah no problem. It, it happens to all of us. We've all been there with you. <laughs> so that's why you sent your slides before. Jeremy, um, are you ready to go? We can go next while we figure out how to pull up George's slides. All right, can you hear me? We can hear you very well. Okay, um, I'm going to share my screen. Great. I hope you can see it. And we can see it, yes, it's working. Yes. All right. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I am pretty much going to uh, talk about what we do at Single Single. Pretty much it's, uh, it's an application based on a lot of the discussion that has been going on. And I'm um, going to be talking about one of the use cases we've uh, applied this as single. Now, single, which is pretty much um, one of the things we're trying to do is to uh, pioneer AI software. Uh, so we're pretty much a startup right now uh, in Uganda and then eventually in Africa. But the idea is to have sustainable transportation that is uh, intertwined with uh, sustainable energy because energy is a big part of transportation and to make transportation safer and more affordable. Um, so one of the issues we're handling right now is, um, is the fact that uh, about over 60% uh, of Africans don't have access to actually sustainable transport. Uh, with the case of Uganda, it's a little bit more than that. And those that have access to sustainable, to transportation, some sort of transport, um, it's unreliable, They're heavily infested with traffic, the case of Kampala, as I'll show you soon. And also the alternatives such as the innovations within the electric vehicles are unfeasible because you don't have the infrastructure. And the current uh, issues to addressing things like traffic right now has been to uh, bring up more more buses and uh, to cities and build more uh, traffic signals and junctions. And there's also a higher purchase on, uh, on private vehicles because most of the public transport does not cover the last mile. Now, one of the things we are building, which is pretty much infrastructure based, is what if we had a data, uh, a data driven transportation service to customers, where, which is multi model and multi vendor. And um, this is one of the things we would like to, uh, to pioneer and build. Now, the case of Kampala that we've looked at in the problem still has been just analyzing a lot of um, the use case of transport. Now, the interesting part about it is while the taxes are pretty much the matatus which contribute control 83% of uh, transit customers, vehicular transit uh, passengers, However, they only constitute, if you look at the traffic, they only actually control 21% of the traffic. It means most of the traffic is actually from the private cars and the border border. Now, one of the things we are solving therefore is to address what the traffic, which is what we're trying to handle. So therefore our biggest concentration is to understand this particular, the 43% and the 36%, why they are there and how we can solve it. Therefore, one of the things we're solving um, with single is developing a multi-model and multi-vendor AI-enabled transportation platform. Now, one of the things you're going to see about this is the ones in black here, this is the organized grid-based transport that is existing in Europe. However, the unique case in most in Uganda, as well as most African countries, is that people don't live in organized places. So the land use is very staggered. It's not grid-based like in Europe or pretty much in the US. So people build very sporadically. So while these are the stops that you're seeing, the last mile normally is not covered by any form of public transport. So people choose to buy vehicles for them. And now these vehicles they buy, the people who are affluent who are staying in these areas are the ones that constitute a lot of the traffic. Yet they're only about 9% of the passengers. 
so that's one of the things you're trying to solve to make sure you only handle the last mile in the other modes, but then integrate them with public transport and uh, have all these multi solutions, as you can see. Um, the part of AI and uh, making it multi model and multi vendor is also come to the fact that uh, the current state of the most of the vehicles, uh, pretty much which we're building a single is there is no particular infrastructure. So even if you came with an application, the ability for the application to be relevant to the market is very, very small. So one of the things we're doing is uh, indirectly building infrastructure that various players in the future could use to uh, optimize transport. One of those is, uh, for example, we don't have many traffic junctions. This is a particular junction uh, picture picked off, uh, off the shelf. But what it shows is a typical case in Kampala. We have less than 10% of the city that is covered by traffic junctions, you're talking about traffic control. But we have all manner of vehicles moving all over the place. And now one of the things we're enabling is integrating AI within these vehicles or within the users. Everyone has a mobile phone. If it's not smart, uh, the, the guys in vehicles, we're enabling them uh, with a lot of platforms right now, which I'm going to talk about, which is AI enabled. But one of the key features of it is is to have some sort of traffic control uh, at the junctions where vehicles can communicate and reduce the need of having expensive infrastructure. Number one. Number two, uh, building platforms that enable people never to need, we want to demystify the need for people to own vehicles. Because one of the things we also appreciated about the market is that it's very segmented within the socioeconomic status. The people who feel it's still a big status symbol in most of the African cities to own a vehicle or to have a vehicle, to be seen in a vehicle. So we want to demystify the need to own one. So it's pretty much like car sharing. And um, also we want to therefore use this to solve the first and the last mile. So in other words, the vehicle can be used by about five different people at five different times or even more. And then the other thing is integrated with, uh, with other modes. So I don't have to go all the way. I can go to a park and ride and then go to public transport and then go to all the way. And then also AI uh, enabled ready AI computer vision. These we're actually already building. Now, the first one is we're also easily converting them to electric. It's something we're already uh, developing right now. And then AI for object collision avoidance. But as we integrate AI is also going to be things like traffic management and traffic control. Um, uh, vehicles that can communicate with each other at various places to optimize traffic flow. Uh, this is an example. Jeremy, of just so you know that you're at six minutes. Um, All right, let, let me just watch this. So this is an okay. example of uh, one, one platform we've built, uh, which is a smart card for people who don't have, uh, more than 80% who don't have a, a smartphone. And this is how it operates uh, with the vehicles. Um, uh, this is an example of an application we've already built for the transport. Um, and then this is an example of uh, a transit map we've built uh, as us because we, over time then want to integrate on the GTFS that is for the entire greater Kampala metropolitan area. Um, uh, this is done for the CBD and particularly our pilot route which was from a particular part of Kampala to the end. And then now we are also developing uh, platforms where we're now building electric vehicle conversions and infrastructure to make uh, EVs uh, potential place for public transport, which controls 83% of passenger traffic. Um, uh, the growth model we are dealing with is eventually extending the batteries to second and third life to make them more accessible within the African context so that people don't have to own the battery, but it can be used to also support things like energy as well as logistics. Now, this is the way where we think a lot of the commercial element is going to come in. This is part of the team, uh, me with a number of advisors. Uh, we've previously worked on a number of projects like the MIT Vehicle Design Summit project. I've been at KCC where I used to own, head a lot of the transportation um, uh, projects. And I have a number of team members who are GM and also in the energy space. Um, uh, this is uh, Errol, he's the head of traffic, head of traffic in the UK. And this is David, who has been a lot in the maintenance of traffic systems as well. And this is the rest of the team that we're working with largely as we develop most uh, of this infrastructure. Right, with this, um, thank you very much. I would like to thank you for, uh, for the ability to, uh, we, we would like to thank you for the ability to listen to me.
Um, Jeremy, it seems like you're doing a lot of really good work and I wish we had more time to share it. Hopefully we can start to dive into some of the things that you brought up in the question and answers. Um, so I'll pass it back to George. Hopefully we can figure out um, how to share your slides. Um, Sarah, Tolga will be sharing it. Um, Tolga, if you can share your screen. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tolga. Great, thank you. I'll, I'll let you know when uh, to go to the next slide. Apologies, I'm going to have to say next slide a couple of times. Um, thank you a lot for, for inviting me uh, to, to this event. It's been great, some great discussions. Um, my name is George Kibala Bau, and I represent the GSMA Digital Utilities uh, Program. And I'm going to talk a bit about the role of mobile big data in transport planning and some of the enabling factors that allow mobile big data partnerships to form and then also to, to thrive. Uh, next slide please. So uh, just really briefly introducing you to the program I work for. So um, I, the GSMA represents uh, mobile operators uh, worldwide. And within the GSMA, we have a mobile for development foundation, which is uh, donor funded, uh, mostly by uh, the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Department in the UK. And uh, its goal is to drive innovation in digital technology to reduce uh, inequalities um, around the world, mostly linked to the Sustainable Development Goal agenda. And our uh, program's mission specifically is to enable access to affordable, reliable, safe, and sustainable urban utility services through digital solutions and innovative partnerships. Utility services here are defined as energy, water, sanitation, waste management, and transport. Um, some of our activities include research and insights, but we also support a lot of innovators across Africa and Asia through an innovation fund. Um, and we also help innovators build partnerships with mobile operators and uh, government service providers as well. Next slide, please. Um, so. Um, and this slide is a, just an introduction of what mobile big data is. So there are different types of mobile big data, event data, network data, and customer data. For the purposes of this presentation, we'll, we'll focus on, I'll focus on an, anonymized, passively generated, and aggregated event data, mostly CDR data, and what role it can play in transport planning. And one of the key reasons why um, the role of mobile connectivity is more salient now in low and middle income countries is due to the increased um, penetration of mobile services across across Africa and Asia. In, in Africa, um, in, uh, in 2010, we had a unique mobile a penetration rate of 31%, and now it's up to 49%. Obviously, there are still huge gaps, but in urban areas where a lot of these trans transport use cases come from, the penetration rates are also higher, enabling these kinds of analyses to take place. Um, next slide, please. Um, so here, this, this slide just to stress that um, going from mobile big data to actually actionable insights for public policymakers in, involves a complex process that um, involves obviously aggregating and anonymizing the data, combining it potentially with other data sources, but then also figuring out how to translate uh, the, this analysis to, to actually fit fit with the public sector needs because a public sector stakeholder might require a visualization tool, a decision-making support system, or a report. Um, so all of these things have to be taken into account as we package uh, the data and, and um, become a good impact. And this graphic is from our GSMA AI for Impact team that, that does a lot of work uh, on this subject. Um, next slide, please. And um, just uh, really quickly going through some of the key challenges that um, urban uh, that mobile big data um, can help respond to. So um, unequal uh, access to public transit networks, uh, both formal routes and informal routes often uh, tend to tend to prioritize richer neighborhoods, um, pollution and kind of peer, peak traffic management, um, congestion and then also road safety and labor conditions. I won't go into detail as this is known for everyone and just wanted to call out these, these challenges quickly. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, so one key paper on the role of mobile big data um, um, for transport planning is has been, been written in, in 2015 by Sri Ganesh Loktanan, and he looks at the potential of mobile big data as a tool um, for, for um, uh, urban planning and transport planning in Colombo. 
And I, I really like this quote uh, from the paper because it really highlights um, the limits, but also the, the, the utility and potential of mobile big data in resource constrained uh, context. Um, it's not a perfect tool, but in combination with others, it can uh, can uh, drive insights and uh, help policymakers make difficult decisions. Um, next slide, please. Um, so uh, here are some of the key use cases that we've identified through our research on what role mobile big data can play in transport planning. And below that, I've I've mentioned some examples in which mobile operators have uh, collaborated with public authorities on, on a range of these use cases. So you have the modeling, the potential benefits of new infrastructure. For instance, how does a new highway impact mobility patterns in the city? We have an example there from Colombo. Uh, similarly, optimizing bus routes. Uh, Orange Free Vision has, work, has done work in, on, in the car on this subject. Similarly, um, um, our G GSMA AI for Impact team has worked with the Rwanda Utilities Regulatory Authority and MTN Rwanda on using mobile big data to better understand how effective intercity inter uh, bus routes in Rwanda are. And there are also other use cases and an interesting emerging one at the end is kind of looking at the optimal locations for electrical ve vehicle charging infrastructure as a, a lot of African cities as well are increasingly transiting towards uh, e EV as well, slowly but uh, uh, surely. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, I just quickly wanted to, um, I'm not going to be able to go into all the details in the, in the time I was giving on, on this, but I just wanted to quickly highlight um, some of the key things to consider when we talk about uh, partnerships between public and private sector stakeholders that leverage uh, mobile big data. So one has to think about the various components of part partnership establishment, data management, evaluation and sustainability, as well as impact and usage, and think about how they're interrelated in order to make sure that uh, partnerships with mobile operators that leverage this data aren't just uh, pilots uh, that, that don't actually generate any useful data for policymakers, but actually lead to um, data-driven decision-making. Uh, next slide, please. A good way to do that is to kind of look at a, a haves and needs framework. So what do mobile operators have that the public sector needs and what does the public sector have that mobile operators need and kind of think, of, think through some of the uh, synergies involved here. That doesn't only, that's not only useful when thinking about partnerships involving mobile operators, but also for instance, private ride hailing companies that are also playing an increasingly big role in terms of generating data on, on transport. Um, next right, slide, please. You're at your six minutes, just so you know. Okay, okay I'll, I'll be wrapping up with the last one. Um, so yeah, um, here's some of the key enabling factors of mobile big data partnerships. And if you want to read more about these, there's a lot to say about each, uh, each, each one of these. Um, we have a forthcoming report uh, that should be coming out during the week of the 19th uh, of July, where we look at innovative uh, data sources for urban planning and what some of the enabling factors of public-private partnerships that leverage innovative data are. Um, you, 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 can, you can think about obviously a lot of um, different uh, considerations on the public sector side, digital capacity, public sector champions, but then also on the, on the private sector side, what, 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 what kind of business models and partnership models will make it likely for mobile operators to, to share data with, with researchers or government institutions? Those are really interesting questions that we explore in the, in the, in the paper, and I'm also happy to cover uh, further um, in the discussion component. Just uh, wanted to lastly um, say one thing on the role of mobile big data and, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Our GSMA AI for Impact team has worked with a lot of uh, governments in low and middle income countries, including the Democratic Republic of Congo, Rwanda, and Burkina Faso on using mobile big data in their, in their COVID-19 response. And this is really highlight, and a lot of policymakers have really um, woken up to the potential of, of these data sources, but also have, have learned more about how to build successful partnerships with offer operators. So we think it's also an interesting uh, time to, to, to consider the potential of these data sources um, now. And um, just lastly, I wanted to share my uh, sort of final slide. Uh, next slide, please, sorry. Um, yes, if you would like to stay in touch uh, with me, feel free to um, email me, uh, follow me on Twitter, 
And um, maybe two reports that might be of interest, um, the one on our work during the COVID-19 pandem 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 pandemic with regards to mobile big data, and then also the forthcoming uh, report that I mentioned. We have a launch event with data.org on that uh, on August 4th, if you're interested, and uh, would love to, would love to see you there. Thank you. Thank you, George. Um, such important work thinking about how we can use uh, mobile data, especially in cases where no other data exists. I think what was really exciting about all of the talks in this panel is the fact that so much data is missing that's essential to make decisions, but each one of these participants was trying to leverage existing data sets to create um, important infrastructure. And this is something that's been really near and dear to my heart and something I wrote about in the last chapter of my book, Data Action, the fact that we really need to uh, leverage mobile oper operator data in order to create new infrastructure data. Um, and I thought like potentially what would be a great first question is like, what are the biggest barriers to overcome when doing the work that each one of you are doing? Um, and, um, and perhaps we can then ask participants to add any questions that they have into the chat and they can be answered because I know that we need to close up this session. So maybe just going backwards, forwards, George, what is kind of the biggest challenge you face as you're trying to leverage um, this mobile data and, and translate them into something that really can be used for policy impact? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Sarah. That's that's a great question, um, and I think uh, there there are a number of, of challenges. Um, I'll just give like a brief uh, overview because I work for the GSMA, so I often get asked by researchers or um, um, uh, development practitioners, for instance, about how how uh, can I can I get access to this operator's data to study this? And obviously, it's not as easy of a process as as that, and one actually has to think think about building long term partnerships with operators in order to, to make this work. Um, there, there, there are a range of, of, of different barriers, obviously like mobile, unique mobile penetration rates, for instance, across African countries range quite considerably, right? One can compare mobile penetration in Malawi with mobile penetration in Kenya, for instance. So just sort of that, that, that obviously is a, a sort, of, sort of basic barrier. But then when one looks at the partnerships, right? Um, the digital capacity of public sector stakeholders also has a huge degree of heterogeneity. If you look at transport authorities as well across the continent, the, the, the degree to which they are very data driven is quite, varies quite a bit. So it's also important to think about which use cases fit with which sort of uh, capabilities. So I think that's a very key um, point. And then also, I think it's important for you know the public sector or research researcher that would like to leverage mobile big data to think to put themselves a bit into the shoes of the mobile operator and think about why 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 would they uh, share data with me and what, how can I you, you know um, um, also outline a value proposition for the operator. Uh, to, to share data. Whether they're, they're, um, our GSMA AI for Impact team covers this in a report, but there are obviously a range of different business models for which data can be shared. Some of them um, involve the data that could be shared for free, uh, but in other cases, there are also payments involved, or in some cases, uh, donors, donors pay for data. So it's also important to kind of think about the, the business model uh, perspective. And of course, I think another key challenge is that um, um, su uh, the successful projects that I've seen sort of combine uh, mobile uh, big data with a huge with a lot of other uh, data sources as well as a strong understanding of, of local context, domestic political economies, and so on. Um, and it's really important to build interdisciplinary teams that work on these um, big data projects. So we don't just sort of generate generate insights that then don't take into account these these uh, local dynamics. I think those are some of the, the key things. We obviously also have to take into account um, questions around data privacy, cross-border sharing, uh, cross-border data, data sharing, and so on, as the regulatory landscape uh, differs quite a bit across countries there. 
and also take into account that mobile operators across the world differ quite substantially in terms of their own digital capacities, right? So a lot of mobile operators have groups and, 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 and sometimes uh, at group level, uh, their big data team might have um, huge capabilities, but then in country, um, uh, those might not be the same. So it's also kind of important to, to, to pay attention to that. And we as a GSMA, um, are very committed to help other stakeholders in the development ecosystem. Um, I, I'm very committed to exploring how we can help other um, uh, stakeholders in the ecosystem access data more effectively and also helping operators to develop their internal capacities more um, so they can uh, generate useful insights. Um, great, George. Um, I wanted to hear from uh, Jeremy and also Philip, but I think we're very delayed. So um, I would love if you could, uh, Jeremy and Philip, please enter what you think is the biggest challenge um, into the chat so we can share it with the group. Um, and I'm sorry that I won't be able to allow you to, to uh, give your thoughts. Uh, over voice, but I think over chat will be great. And that's one of the great things of having this new technology. And thanks so much for joining us today. And I'll pass it over to uh, Ayman to get to the, uh, the next section of the talks. Thanks so much, everyone, for sharing your important work with us today. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you to all panelists. We're very sorry we, we didn't have enough time to get to some of the, the other questions, but please feel free to use the chat. And, and if you have any follow-ups, please um, do communicate over chat. Over to you, Gashal, for the final session. And um, after that, we'll do a very short wrap up. Thank you everyone for, for giving us all your time. Okay, thank you, Iman. And thank you everyone for staying. And I want to say also good, good morning and good afternoon. So this is going to be the last panel discussion that we have. And thank you for WRI and FD for organizing this uh, workshop uh, this panel discussion will focus mainly on the unlocking the power of transit data for sustainable and inclusive mobility system in africa so we will have uh, three female uh, panelists and each from different sectors and different uh, op they have different opinions actually they want to sh share with us so i'll briefly introduce them and uh, we can uh, we can go directly to their presentation so the first panelist will be uh, carly She's a team leader at UNEP, and Carly is a manager for the UNEP team of African mobility and digitizing and mode integration works with countries around the world to decap mobility from increasing emission. Uh, she has been working in the sector for more than 15 years, and before uh, joining UNEP also, she used to work in different firms. And you can check more of their bios actually uh, on their uh, profiles. And uh, the next panelist will be Fatumata. She is a PhD candidate and uh, she is working <coughs> in a research called In Comparative Political Sociology at the Center of International Studies of Science. Her work is uh, investigating the implementation of urban transport projects and circulation of urban policy models around the world. And she will give us some of her uh, thoughts and feedbacks uh, uh, towards the uh, digitizing the, the transportations. Uh, the, the last panelist will be Sherlyn, and uh, she is also the, the director for the uh, Moving on Lab uh, African, and uh, she, she, she will give us also more uh, briefing on the human-centered approach uh, towards uh, solving the design problems and also uh, different topics that she will address for us. So uh, without further ado, I will uh, ask uh, Carly to present. Thank you. Right, thanks and so much, Kishore. Can you see my slides okay? Yes, we can see your slide. And please right. let's keep uh, six minutes presentations. And yeah, thanks. I'm just going to say hi to everyone, but then turn my video off just because I have awful internet today. Um, so yeah, thanks for inviting me to be part of this great workshop. I'll definitely keep to time. Um, the team I manage at UNEP has very much been focused on active mobility, but over the last few months, we've started planning our own internal strategy on how, as the environmental voice, we contribute more to the digitalization of mobility. So this workshop is very timely for me personally and professionally. 
And I guess I think my input here is more of a challenge to myself and to everyone working in the data and digitalization space. And I think I actually have more questions than answers, but I don't know if that's um, a bad thing. So I think sometimes, you know, we get really caught up in the solutions and we sometimes forget about the people. And I want to start by asking what we think as an audience, the average person in an African city or an African peri-urban or rural environment needs from us as the development community, as the experts. Um, and, you know, I would say, go as far as to say the most urgent need is to allow the majority of people in any given context who also happen to be the most vulnerable and have the least environmental impact to move those people around safely now and in the future. Um, and if we look at how people travel, and this is a slide borrowed from our colleagues at ITDP, for the Kenya context, it's not surprising news. We all know that the majority of people in African cities are walking and cycling. And this is a pretty conservative look at cities in Kenya. So in Nairobi, 40 percent walking in Mombasa, 46 percent walking and cycling. And in, in Kasumu, you know, 56 percent. If you take a city like Dakar, it's up to 90 percent of the daily mode are walking and cycling. And we always, you know, we always focus on the road safety stats, don't we? Africa has the highest fatality rates in the whole world. We chime out those stats in the development community over and over again. But I also want to challenge us because, you know, have things got so bad that we only measure success for active mobility on whether we die when we're walking or not? And, you know, what about just comfort and enjoyment and just feeling great when you walk or cycle? Um, these are some steps from IRAP, and it's pretty clear that for the majority, almost 100% for both walking and cycling, streets are not meeting the minimum level of service. And obviously the focus of these last few days is about public transit. And we also know that with regards to access to public transit using UN Habitat data, only 35% of citizens in African cities are within 500 metres of access to public transport. So what does all of this actually mean for transit data? And I guess this is really where my questions come in, because, of course, we need good public transport and we need transit data to support it for all the reasons we've heard in the last few days. But how can we use public transit data for the greater good? Because if we know that 50 to 90 percent of people are walking and cycling, how can we use that data for public transport and transit to support the vast majority? For a fact, we know that everyone who uses a bus starts as a pedestrian and ends their journey as a pedestrian. So if we're talking about public transport users, we are 100 percent also talking about pedestrians and sometimes talking about cyclists. And I think and I guess this is my challenge to this community that we are focusing so much on mapping public transit data, but actually we should be looking at public transit and active mobility together because one cannot be without the other. And they're really two sides of the same coin. They belong together and should be planned and mapped together. You know, what's the point of having public transit data to understand 20% of the journey, but actually the rest of the journey is unmapped. We don't know what's happening for that first and last mile connectivity. And I think if we could start thinking them more as a kind of joint partnership, then we could start using that more rich data to advocate, to show decision makers, governments and banks, how people are walking or cycling to reach public tra transit and how walking and cycling is in effect a feeder to transit. And that could support the transport planning process. Um, I also wondered how maybe we could do more at mapping the nuances of the use of transit and active mobility to understand understand the different needs of the different um, user groups. And finally, um, you know, I think it can be quite overwhelming for governments to jump from pretty much zero or low investment in active mobility to doing more and actually linking active mobility to public transit is a very good focused way as a kind of first step to how you budget if we can just get governments to build infrastructure for pedestrians and, and cyclists as a start around and connected to transit stops that would be a good first step so I guess I just wanted to put that out there as some food for thought and I know we don't have much time now but maybe we can carry on the discussion offline thank you thanks Carly <clears throat> so 
Yeah, you, you raised an important uh, points here, like we don't need to map only the public transport, but to integrate them with the active mobility, which is an important uh, point that we get from you. And there could be some uh, questions on the question and answer. Uh, so we will have that maybe after uh, we finish the presentation from everyone. So uh, I can, I think, I guess we can go to Fatumata and maybe you can proceed Fatumata, please. Sure, okay. Uh, yes. Great, so first and foremost, thanks so much for allowing me to be here. I'm very grateful to uh, have listened to all of this and to, yeah, just, you know, engage with uh, so many uh, interesting presentations and presenters. Um, so my name is Fatoumata Diallo. I am a PhD researcher uh, in comparative political science, uh, sorry, in, in comparative uh, sociology in um, Sciences Po. And basically uh, what I'm doing is I'm looking into the implementation of three big infrastructure projects being namely uh, the Cape Town BRT, the Lagos BRT Lite, and uh, a BRT system in Greater Paris. Uh, and I'm trying to retrace the processes uh, of, um, yeah, their implementation. And I've learned quite a lot of things from it. Uh, and here I'm trying to share a few lessons. They're mainly linked to the way in which I um, collect my data, right? My expertise is in public policy analysis, so while my methodological apparatus is quite diverse, uh, it, is, it revolves around semi-structured interviews, okay? So that means that I sit with so many actors on a daily basis, be they, uh, you know, elected officials, planners, engineers, um, or, you know, informal transport, uh, sorry, uh, paratransit operators um, on a daily basis, but they're also, you know, communications department members or um, members of the community we don't give uh, you know, a voice to often or opponents to the project. And being at the center of all of this allows me to get perspectives that I get, uh, you know, perspectives that maybe from one respondent that other respondents do not have. And that has raised the question of access to that data to me. Um, and I'm trying to uh, show you today how qualitative research can help you and help us all in fostering uh, inclusive and sustainable uh, transport environments. Uh, so let's get right into it with three lessons I've learned uh, from being a qualitative researcher working on transport. So first, um, stakeholders from across the board need to be included. Um, this is something that we all now understand and we're, we all agree on, but my point here is that they really need to be included at all stages. Um, and basically that we need to go beyond uh, the consultation um, processes and the consultation templates basically that we know of um, in, in big projects, right? In, in common, that are common in big projects. So an illustration of that from my own research is uh, the attitude in Cape Town towards um, paratransit operators uh, that has majorly shifted throughout the life of the BRT projects, right? Uh, the BRT was supposed to replace them. And then as policymakers uh, understood better how uh, the paratransit operators maybe serve um, the population in ways that are more beneficial than some feeder services, for instance, that they had planned, uh, they switched to cooperation and basically, um, you know, it shows that in yeah. some, hello, yes, <laughs> in some governance uh, systems, there's no room for uh, maybe paratransit operators' um, expertise or flair or discourses. And most importantly, there isn't room for the data that, that they can bring not only the numerical data, the digital data, but also uh, the qualitative data that they can bring in the form of their experiences. Um, secondly, data collection is often seen as a precondition for big transport projects, big infrastructure projects, uh, but it's also and mostly uh, a goal, right? Uh, basically, I want us to shift our vision from, um, ask, like from basically considering that 
some project leaders didn't have enough data to achieve a certain, uh, maybe a certain standard or a certain level of op um, optimality. Um, but instead, think of projects as ways to get that data, right? So for instance, in Cape Town, um, passengers are pretty much averse to standing, um, whereas vehicles had been devised in ways that privileged um, a certain amount of standing space, right? Uh, and that has very, mater like very real material consequences. Um, but the important thing here is not to consider it as a failure, but to consider it as data that will be important for future projects or even for refurbishment, right? So uh, new vehicles can just simply have more seats. Um, lastly, I want to mention that it's important to create adaptable solutions uh, and to make peace with the fact that there's a lot of data in our cities and African cities that cannot be retrieved um, basically I, like at the ideal moment. That is not just a proper uh, of African cities, right? So for instance, the Lagos BRT light had the big ramp up uh, from 60, like expecting 65,000 passengers and actually having more than 200,000 quite quickly. Uh, but the solution was adaptable enough to add vehicles and to basically the governance system was flexible enough for it to be a learning curve rather than uh, a straight up failure, basically. And that is my point here. Um, lastly, two insights because I'm uh, short on time. One, I want us all to combine the use of data as it comes in many forms, not only you know uh, data as we can think of and you know through the marvelous projects we've heard of, uh, today, but also qualitative data. That is a, a, like, there's an important uh, stake here of joining both types of data or even, you know, all sorts of data to actually unlock uh, the, the power it can have on transport. Um, and then secondly, I really, really want us to think outside the box when it comes to participation. A lot of participation frameworks, as we know them, only attract a specific type of public. And that is unfortunate. So let's think outside the box. Uh, let's find the data that is out here and let's invite qualitative research into uh, the crafting of our transport environments uh, in order to make them more uh, inclusive and more sustainable. Thank you all. Thank you, Fatoumata. So yeah, we learned uh, so, so many important things from your presentation and maybe just to, to mention a few of them is like uh, we need to have those stakeholders engagements in, in, uh, in all our uh, activities starting from the planning to the implementation phases and data collection should not be seen as a precondition. Uh, so these are some of the good things that we uh, that I get from your presentation, and there could be a couple of uh, things also uh, on the comments and question and answer, which we will be dealing with uh, after the next presentation. So uh, without uh, saying much, I can invite also due to the time constraint. Also, maybe I, I will invite uh, Charlene to 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 start your presentation. Okay. And sorry if I didn't pronounce your name correct. Are you all able to see the presentation? Hello, can no. you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, but yeah, now it's fine. You can continue. Okay, thank you very much uh, for having me. Uh, I'm Charlene Kwasi, so I'm uh, representing the African uh, Mobilities Observatory. Um, for those who may not know uh, the, uh, the OMA, uh, it is a community of interest uh, created by Michelin in uh, 2017. And uh, our mission, our main mission is to provide knowledge on uh, African mobility uh, towards sustainable mobility. And we are now uh, co-constructing um, an ecosystem uh, with uh, the Moving On Lab members to actually uh, bring innovations and also uh, sharing good practices and 
finally uh, having some uh, important projects, field projects uh, implemented uh, on the ground. So we have a diverse and mobilizable uh, network uh, that we work with, um, especially in local projects, but also in workshops that we organize uh, monthly. So the um, knowledge that we provide is on various formats we can find you can find articles, uh, crossroads as well, video reports, um, and on-demand assignments uh, as well. So today I'm, um, I was uh, really hoping to, uh, to show that uh, data can be uh, exploit, um, exploited sorry, in various uh, modes, but it has to be essentially uh, towards a human-centered approach. And we observe that uh, some of um, processes, uh, some projects are actually going uh, towards that. So for me, how to unlock uh, the powers of data is to work together. So basically, um, and there are uh, actually few of them, a uh, few of projects that include coalitions, for example, that um, especially uh, address issues, but uh, in a multi-sectoral way. Uh, it could be in transport, it could be on every um, sectors of the economy, uh, but it's, it is proved that, and, and is it, it is legitimate, sorry, as well, uh, that working in coalitions uh, is, is um, a great asset to, uh, to reach sustainable mobility. Uh, working in ecosystem as well, uh, it's important. Uh, simply to build a network. We have a lot of innovations out there. We heard a lot today and uh, they are not, we're, we're not lacking of, of, of them. But uh, the main problems, the main issues I, I want to stress uh, today is the participation and inclusion. Uh, we need to uh, to work closer with the communities. I I totally agree with uh, Fatumata Diallo that that uh, mentioned that uh, earlier. Uh, most of the time, uh, we I mean when I say we, uh, I say the the local governments or the uh, African countries do, does not uh, include enough uh, communities in their um, in their projects, and uh, it is also um, pretty much linked to communication uh, and monitoring. Because uh, if we don't have um, strong mechanisms and also um, a framework, a consultative framework to uh, to address uh, the issues of the population, and we work uh, only on a, on a, I would say an, a one one centered view, uh, like in governments, for example, or the civil uh, society aside, we can't reach. Uh, uh, we can't reach uh, the, the the greatest goal, which is uh, achieving sustainable mobility. I'm going to present briefly um, a project that uh, we have supported with uh, Climate Chance, uh, which is the roadmap for sustainable mobility in Côte d'Ivoire. And to see that uh, with a participative approach and a consultative uh, framework, we could actually um, uh, bring impact and uh, actually value, uh, value to, uh, to a project, uh, uh, to any project of mobility actually. So it is a project that has been supported by Climate Chance, PPMC, financed by the uh, Michelin Foundation as well. And uh, it has actually um, followed the action agenda of the COP21. Uh, so based on the PPMC tool and the PPMC uh, macro roadmap, um, Climate Chance uh, actually uh, engaged this process of roadmap in, um, in uh, African cities. And we have strongly worked with them to actually bring a regional and local uh, roadmap of sustainable mobility because territories and characteristics of mobility are different uh, in, uh, in various country and uh, also in, 
in one country, it could it could be um, issues could be different and problematics as well. So after Morocco, uh, we uh, actually um, implemented not implemented, but we've created this uh, roadmap for Côte d'Ivoire with uh, various axes uh, that we focused on uh, ten actually. And uh, one of them is also uh, digitization uh, of mobility uh, and, um, and decarbonation as well. So uh, data has been uh, a great, um, a great uh, asset to this roadmap because uh, with the support of the communities, uh, we organized workshops to actually um, provide um, um, a more complete uh, document, a more complete guide to submit to the governments, knowing that uh, in Abidjan the the mobility uh, um, the mobility issues are different than in the north or in the in the center of the country, for example. So we gathered a multi-stakeholder uh, um, 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 actually uh, workshops. To, to involve them and uh, to, uh, to provide a better roadmap uh, that, uh, uh, that um, a better roadmap uh, actually. Uh, so it is uh, actually a, a, a replicable um, process that we, that we have provided that could be actually duplicated in many countries. Um, regarding the needs, of course, and uh, the uh, expectations of the people and of the, the authorities. And uh, apart from these projects, uh, there are also a, a lot of them. I, I won't mention, uh, 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 I, I could actually, uh, I couldn't mention all of them, but um, projects that actually involve local communities uh, present. Sorry, uh, we are running out uh, of time. You can. Ah, okay. Make... I'm really sorry. Yeah, okay, no problem. Uh, just, just uh, to conclude, many projects uh, of data of mapping exist. It's not the problem, but uh, behind the public transit, uh, there is a whole informal and unstructured system. Uh, we talked about paratransit a lot of times, uh, but without a regulatory framework, it can't really be sustainable. So uh, I think that the main focus that we have to keep in mind is supporting and promoting these uh, innovations, these local innovations uh, that actually work closer with the communities and uh, also uh, include their expertise in, uh, in, the, in the policies uh, in place. So the full attention should be uh, actually uh, towards uh, what, uh, human, uh, what human do, how they uh, move around the city uh, to, uh, to actually address a proper financement, uh, financing to that. So we need... Uh, a lot more collaborative uh, process, real collaborative process involving uh, data communities, experts, uh, and all these uh, mechanisms have to be driven by uh, transport organizing authorities. So that's why we need to have a strong and a skilled transport organizing authorities that are actually um, open to, uh, to the people and to their urgent need of mobility. All of that with digital tools as well, uh, accessible to all. Thank you very much for, for listening. Okay. Thanks, uh, Charlene. And uh, thanks everyone who was on this panel. And uh, so I was checking the question and answer box and trying to give you some of the questions raised, but uh, there is only one question I think was addressed, I uh, was asked by Agrao and it says, what are some of the best practice if Carly is still here, I guess that, that was for Carly or, but we can also forward this question for Patumata and uh, Charlene. What are some of the best practices in African context that maximizes transit usage and minimizes the safety issue? So maybe I can start with Patumata. Sure, okay. Let me get the question right. The best practice is maximizing, sorry. So yeah, in, he says in maximizing data transit usage and minimizes the safety issue. 
Yes, I mean, that is, I feel like that question was answered uh, earlier today, like all throughout the, the, the seminars, uh, in the sense that when people know better how to access their transport and when people know better how to um, reach their destination, uh, transit usage, and like when they have this, that certainty that transit usage is going to deliver on that promise, um, you know, that is the best way to go. So I feel like there isn't necessarily a best practice, but there needs to be patience with how those instruments are uh, introduced uh, with uh, our communities. Charlene, uh... yeah. Yep. Uh, I, I feel. Or... Yep. Um, can you hear me well? Yes, we have also a French translator, uh, so that's what they, they were texting me, actually, they were recommending me. If you want, you can also use the French language and anything that makes you. We have a translator also. Okay, yes. Okay. Uh, bah, très bien, bon, je, peux, je peux switcher en français, ça fait longtemps. Uh, alors, um, par rapport aux, aux différentes initiatives qui, um, qui minimisent justement le, les, les problèmes de sécurité, euh, notamment routière et qui maximise les, euh, les, les data au niveau du transport public. Euh, on a un certain nombre d'applications qui sont mises en place, euh, mais qui sont, euh, à mon sens, en balbutiement, dans le sens où elles ne sont pas encore euh, très opérationnelles et accessibles euh, pour, un, pour un public qui est large. Il y a de nombreuses initiatives qui sont, qui sont mises en place, Notamment au niveau de la Côte d'Ivoire, on, euh, on a la Sotra qui développe actuellement une application euh, bon, plutôt interne euh, d'une part, mais euh, qui, va être, euh, qui va être mise à disposition du public. Euh, on a des startups aussi qui travaillent sur euh, la question euh, du paiement digital et qui permet euh, en soi d'intégrer euh, plusieurs types de, de transport, donc qui minimise finalement le, euh, la sécurité routière, mais on n'a pas encore… De, en tout cas, bon, je parle pour, pour l'Afrique de l'Ouest, parce que je sais qu'au niveau de, de Go Metro, par exemple, en Afrique du Sud, on a, on a de grandes avancées sur, sur le, la planification des trajets, sur les horaires, sur le temps d'attente. Mais on est encore sur des initiatives qui sont, pour moi, pas assez poussées euh, par euh, les autorités locales pour justement avoir une construction beaucoup plus, euh, beaucoup plus impactante et efficiente sur le terrain. Donc, euh, euh, pour l'instant, je dirais que c'est plus des applications de mapping, justement. C'est pour ça que cet événement est important, d'aller au-delà du mapping euh, et de créer des applications qui soient euh, à, euh, vraiment utilisées par tous et euh, qui, euh, qui minimisent le... le euh, bah les, les problèmes de, de sécurité ou même de planification de, 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 du train de trajet. Et en, en incluant vraiment tous les modes, c'est vraiment le gros défi, euh, c'est d'inclure à la fois euh, le paratransit, le transport artisanal, le transport public qui est aujourd'hui, euh, qui présente une offre déficitaire, euh, qui n'est pas, le, 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 pas le, le système le plus... Euh, Enfin, euh, pas le système dominant finalement, le cœur du transport aujourd'hui c'est le paratransit et c'est vraiment ce, ce pan-là euh, sur lequel il faut se pencher Merci Charlie So thanks everyone uh, and the panelists so uh, we would love to hear more from you guys but since we are, we are running out of time I, I will take this uh, my, uh, I will ask Iman to continue is the rest of the program. Thanks. Th thanks, Kashaw. I think Iman's having some connectivity issues, so I'm going to just um, conclude uh, the sure. event. I, can, I don't know if everyone can see me, um, but uh, I'm Ben Welly with WRI. I'm Director of Integrated Transport. Um, this has been a, a really amazing, um, long, long, and probably late for many people. Um, um, set of presentations and meetings, but it's been very enriching. Um, so excited to see all of this uh, work going on and the information being shared as part of this Digital Transport for Africa Beyond Mapping event. Um, I won't keep people here any more longer than they have to. Everyone probably wants to get on with their evening. 
Um, but I just want to thank um, all the, our panelists, all of our presenters, all of our uh, moderators, and the translators as well, as well as a uh, hats off to our WRI Africa team in organizing this event, and to um, the French Development Agency for their support of Digital Transport for Africa, as well as to the many partners of WRI Africa, uh, or I'm sorry, of, of DT4A. We're going to have future events in this space and we're going to engage with a lot of you um, directly um, and we look forward to doing that. I look forward to the next steps and uh, to a future convening um, probably in about um, by the around November of, of this year. Um, and as I said, some individual outreach that we're hoping to announce very as well as this mini grant we're probably going to announce uh, in the coming weeks. So I'm gonna stop talking. Again, a big thank you to everyone for, for coming um, and staying into this both this two day event. Everyone take care and, and have a good one. Take, thanks.